Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved fantasy lore, characters, theme series, and more. Thank you for joining us today. We are covering chapters 45 through 51 of Iron Flame by Rebecca Yaros. But before we begin this deep dive, please listen closely to our content warning. Most importantly, we have spoilers for all of Iron Flame. We may be focusing on chapters 45 through 51 today, but we are bringing the whole book into the conversation, which means everything from Iron Flame, Fourth Wing, and anything else that Rebecca Yaros has said, it's all on the table. So if you don't know why we will be geeking out over Rune's class today, please go finish the book. We will be here when you're done. Next up, and we have never meant this more, this podcast is rated R. We at Fantasy Fangirls are adults who say adult things, very adult things, with adult words about an adult book. Two words. Throne scene. That's all you need to know about how rated R we are about to get on this podcast today. Last thing before we jump into our Iron Flame episode nine. If you love fantasy fangirls and you want to support us in making this dream our livelihood, if you want more content, more community connection, especially as we get to CC3's release, we have a lot of community around that right now. Discounts on merch like this beautiful mug I'm sporting today. Hey, with that new logo. And early access to episodes plus oodles more, please check out our Patreon. We have two membership tiers, Cadets and Dragon Riders. We just hosted our January live Q&A. We have a bunch of stuff up the pipeline happening for our Patreon community, so come and join us over there. The link is in the show notes or YouTube captions, and really and truly, thank you so much for helping us bring these episodes to you. And now, it is time. My house, my chair, my Woman! Huzzah! 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 <laughs> Let's begin this episode deep dive with Battle Brief, aka Nicole's summary of what happens in chapters 45 through 51 of Iron Flame. Chapter 45. At formation, the newly dead riders and Griffin Flyers are listed. Off to a happy start here, friends. And it hits Violet that at the rate that they're dying, they only have two months left before the Eurasian riders are Gonzo. Violet and her squad also notice that the Griffin Flyers take the news of death very differently. They have emotions. Huh. As they're dispersing, Violet laments to her squad that Cat, aka the walking piece of terror, is doing ungodly things to make her life miserable. Bodhi arrives and tells Rianne that second squad has a new class added to their schedule, taught by Professor Trissa. Skippy, skippy, it's time for that new class. In the Toasty Valley, our squad is waiting for Rune's class to begin, and of course, they're paired with Cat's Drift. And who is leading the teeth-bearing hatred but Darna, whose scales look a little red today? Huh. Weird. Rune's class begins, and it's 3D geometry meets interpretive dance, and these students are rightly very confused. We get a mega Rune download. Stay tuned for today's archive section. And our squad has one assignment. Do a simple unlocking Rune and put it on the wooden board. Violet, feeling intimidated by Taryn's gargantuan power, reaches instead for Indarna's power, making it just a little easier. And yes, we will be talking in depth about this moment. Everyone is clueless and ends up with scorch marks beneath their feet. Well, everyone except for smug cat. Chapter 46. In their room one morning, Violet is working on her runes homework and Zayden has just stepped out of the shower. These two have really found their own domestic rhythm. Violet starts to ask questions. Well, the safe questions at least about Zayden putting runes in her daggers and the stone with a super complex rune at the side of his bed, which turns out Liam's mom, Colonel Mari, wove that one and it was how the rebellion relics were created. Zayden eggs her on to ask more questions, but Violet halts. She doesn't want to risk the disruption of their happiness that they've created. Violet heads off to Rune's class, realizing that she might only have like a B plus Rune in her hand. Next week, we're back into sparring lessons and the teachers have had it with these Griffin Flyers slash Rider squabbles. For today and today only, they are allowed to challenge anyone they'd like to on the mat because tomorrow their separate squads are being absorbed and combined together. And according to Codex, you cannot challenge anyone in your own squad. Of course, Cat challenges Violet. After a few blows and swings that feel oddly familiar, these two ladies realize Zayden has taught them both how to fight. Chapter 47. Naturally, Kat uses this information to absolutely fuck with Violet's head, not only taunting her about how Zayden had Kat first, but also using her mind powers to make Violet's emotions absolutely take over her completely. Basically, Kat's just being a complete bitch. But our girl has the upper hand because she wasn't only trained by Zayden. Using some of Rhiannon's moves, Violet gets the best of Kat and damn near kills this walking piece of terror. But a voice pops into her head. Zayden approves of this murder, woof, but he is worried that Violet might not want the consequences of killing his ex. 
honestly fair. Violet very well might kill her though and through their bond she asks Satan for help and he obliges. Grabbing Violet off of Kat and hauling her into another room. The assembly chamber? Huh, why did he take her in there? Telling all of the assembly members to get the fuck out, Violet asks Satan how much of that fight he heard. Turns out it was all of it. Well, fuck. Chapter 48. It is time. Zayden in his house on his chair, sets his woman down and starts to undress her, much to Violet's confusion. But he knows exactly the distraction she needs and our shadow daddy absolutely goes to town on his girl and... Oral bang, oral bang, orally bang. I said, oh, 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 orally bang. Hey, hey. <laughs> Satan changes her thoughts, which are definitely not on Cat anymore and neither are his. And because of that, we get a glimpse on how just not on Cat his thoughts are. Violet hears his thoughts. Thoughts. After Violet is basically a limp noodle in this chair, she notices that Zayden is off. And yes, we will be talking about it. These two start to fight about Kat, about the questions game, and about how Violet is just feeling inferior to Kat as a whole. Zayden ensures Violet that she is the only one for him and gives her some harsh truths. Kat's power only works on what you're already emotionally feeling. It's time for our girl to get some control over her emotions. Also, Zayden gave her a dagger that counteracts Kat's gifts. This would have been great to know, Zayden. Thank you. But as these two parts, the matter closed. He makes her promise to come to bed early tonight and my pulse skyrockets. Chapter 49. It's time to absorb a drift of Griffin Flyers and of course, Violet Squad gets Cat's drip. Who else would they get? Violet grabbing a hold of her emotions and her anti-cat dagger. She gives Cat the Iron Squad patch and she also gives her a quick, hey, thanks for teaching Zayden a very specific bedroom maneuver. Violet Squad, who definitely overhears every word basically bows down to Violet as she leaves Kat speechless. The squad heads to the library and after shamelessly watching Sawyer try to flirt with Jacinia, Dane walks in right on time to help Violet translate Warwick's journal. The next day in the Wardstone chamber, Violet and Dane are still poring over said journal. Dane is horrified that Violet did not read the whole damn book. She just followed the TikTok sound and skipped to the good part. But Dane starts to open up the conversation about last year and him cupping her face. Violet is like, nope, I don't want to hear it. Imbue the story. Stone, please. So Dane concedes with one last question. Do you love Zayden Ryerson? Because watch out, Violet. Dane might just take him from you. After a confirmation, Dane agrees that he will begin to trust Zayden too. Chapter 50. Violet is training again with Felix for her signet. And hey, our girl has been practicing. She's getting so much better at controlling the small sustained lightning where she is the energy source. Like, damn girl, this is huge. Finishing up her lesson with Felix, she feels a melancholy Zayden and she heads to Ryerson house, grabbing a plate of food, she nearly guffaws at Garrick, Bodie, and Heaton, who's looking pretty fucked up right about now. The three tell her that the Venon have taken Pavis, completely skipping over Corden, and Pavis is right outside of Drathus. Basically, they're a hop, skip, and a jump from Eratia. They're a common. Chapter 51. Zayden is moody, brooding, on the rooftop of Ryerson House, and Violet brings him a slice of chocolate cake. Honestly, I need to just tell Brett to do this for whenever I am sad, too. Zayden laments that they are outgunned, outmanned, out numbered, outplanned, and 50 years too late. Not quite as inspirational as George Washington and Hamilton, but there you go. He also notes that the reason that they ran from Pavis today wasn't because people were dying. Nope, it was because Mira saw Zayden almost get got by a venom and she didn't want to risk Violet's life. Basically, he's like, oh, this is how you've been feeling for like a year now from the marked ones. Several weeks later, Violet and Dane are killing themselves trying to get this damn book translated. They learned already that Iron Rain is actually Iron Flame. Hey! is that the name of this book? But it's still not making sense. Violet sends Dane to bed, but keeps going on. She realizes another word might have also been mistranslated. It's the breath of life, not the blood of life. Running to Rhiannon, Violet paces in front of her friend. She knows how to raise the wards but she's not sure she should. Dun, dun, dun. So Lexi, this stretch of chapters includes a lot of Violet fearing asking Zayden questions because she's worried about bringing up a healthy communication streak in their relationship. Violet could really use some help from a therapist, which is why we're so excited that this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. You know, around New Year's, we tend to reflect on how to improve ourselves in whatever way that means to you. Therapy helps you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that truly stick specifically for you. I started therapy right before my wedding because I was noticing a lot of stress and pressure starting to eat away at me. And my husband, who's been in therapy for years, loves it. And he suggested I give it a try. It changed my 
life. Not only helping me release stress for my wedding day, but it also helped me with communication, managing negative emotions, and especially helping me when everything with Fantasy Fangirls popped off later last year. My therapist is my favorite person. So incredibly helpful. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, but don't worry if you need to switch therapists at any time, it's no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com FFG today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash FFG. Before we don our signet powers today and dive into key insights from this stretch of chapters, I personally want to quickly apologize for my congested voice and to also just say a big thank you to Nicole for carrying this episode. Quick behind the scenes, both my kids and I have been very sick this week. My husband has been out of town and my brain has been absolute mush. So I am not on my A game today. I'm not on my B game. I like might be on my C minus game and probably no one's surprised. Nicole and I like to be on our A game at all times. So I apologize in advance for today and my voice (laughs) I love you Lex no worries and the fun thing is I'm starting to come down with it now so I'm like I can see you into my future and I'm like well fuck I know that's what you get for coming over and helping me with the kids which I so appreciated (laughs) which I would do a thousand times over again and again but let's start this donning our signet deep dive with chapter 45's epigraph because Wow, do we learn some big stuff in this epigraph? Number one, we learned that 50 years ago, Venon were only coming from the barons. And number two, we learned that they're taking recruits from those who have never bonded griffins. So if they are taking those who didn't bond griffins, who is to say that they're also not taking those who didn't bond a dragon or who didn't bond a powerful dragon, looking at you, Jack fucking Barlow, or hell, even infantry. Those who were like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to go into the rider's quadrant. I'll go into this instead. But then they see every dope thing that the rider's quadrant is doing and they're like, damn, I want more power. Let me channel from the source. So when I think about this geographically, it makes absolute sense that the Venon target want to be griffin flyers because the Venon are invading poor meal and they get stopped at the wards. However, we also know that you can still turn Venon within the wards. So I agree that there is way more undercover Venon recruitment that we will definitely learn about in book three. I am like terrified to learn about who is Venon versus who is not because I've got some speculations and I'm nervous. I'm very nervous. I have decided I don't think Colonel Atos is a Venon. I do think that Varish was one, but I don't think Colonel Atos was. I don't think Colonel Atos is a Venon. I do think he's working with venom in some I agree. way yes. yes there's even some speculation about brennan being venom and i'm just like oh i don't i just i don't know there's so many possibilities and i just i what did you say a few episodes innocent until proven venom yes, <laughs> they're innocent until proven venom <laughs> I'm kind of liking that. So let's lean into formation, which kicks off this stretch of chapters. This line right here, quote, the entirety of the Eurasian quadrant will be dead in less than two months at this rate. First and foremost, congratulations, Violet, for doing some quick math here in formation. But this was a wild line to read. It shows just truly how hopeless this fight is. Zayden later on in this stretch of chapter says we're 50 years too late. And it really just cements how true that statement is. Well, and that 50 years too late, it ties right into the above mentioned epigraph too, quoting, it was only in the last 50 years that we realized they were no longer solely coming from the barons. So I just find that so interesting, those parallels between the 50 years and have to wonder if there's a correlation. Oh God, that makes my stomach bottom out. Now, the human nature of the Griffin Flyers. One of the things I really enjoyed learning about in Iron Flame is how everything we knew slash felt towards the Griffin Flyers from Fourth Wing is literally turned upside down. They were the number one enemy in Fourth Wing and now it is literally their com- their comrades. Fourth Wing never outright states that Griffins are heartless attackers or anything like that, but it is very heavily implied. And also just like in most instances in war, when you are far, far, far on one side, especially us being in Violet's mind, far, far, far on one side, she's literally the general's daughter, you tend to think of the worst about the opposing enemy. So it makes sense that we were very 
against the Griffin Flyers up until, I mean, honestly, part two of this book. Well, and remember all of Markham's propaganda in Battle Brief from part one. It was so interesting to see the propaganda that pins the writers and Navarian citizens against the Griffin Flyers and the poor Amelians. And now we are really seeing how much more human they are than Navarre. Well, so speaking of that humanness, at formation, they learned that a flyer, Micah Renfrew, has died. And one of the flyers screams their name in like this guttural way. And the writer, specifically Arik, is like throwing down judgment at this flyer, looking at death at like such a highly emotional, oh my god, you inferior person. But that eye-opening moment of oh my god you're allowed to be human with emotions that the writers are challenging inside their brain right now is really interesting and I think that we're going to be seeing this more and more as we go through the rest of the books in this series but I love that it's starting to open up their eyes of oh we're allowed to like feel things around death. And I think that this was so needed after being so buried in the brutality of Biscayeth. You know, our characters are understandably numb to things like this. In fact, the unnecessary brutality of Biscayeth, it's been a big critique of the book because it's so wild how unimportant these lives are. And Iron Flame, it really addresses this issue within the world. And I love how it does that, especially counteracting Fourth Wing and everything we learned in that book. We get one side of it, the stone cold understanding of why back in part one when Violet confides in Ree, remember that big heartbreaking scene and then we get this in part two with a stark comparison with these flyers. I'll be straight up honest even reading fourth wing especially reading fourth wing as many times as we did for this podcast I was getting numb to the brutality of Bezgayeth. I was kind of leaning into that writer's mindset of oh you know orally died darn so sad whatever but I love that this introduction to our story is just such a different way of life. And so basically what I'm saying is, hush, Arik, hush now. (laughs) You can learn to have emotions, my guy. Well, so speaking of humanity and Arik's lack of it, Kat and Violet have this beautiful little, I don't know if beautiful is the right word, a decent little sister truce every morning when they don't hear Mira or Serena's name on the death roll. So shouts to my fellow little sisters out there who have, we all have a bond, just like the big sisters out there all have a bond. Us little siblings, we have a bond as well. And we always want to make sure our older siblings are safe and taken care of. Aww. And humanity's gone. <laughs> because we learned that Kat showed up in a Deverelli silk robe one morning at Violet's store, which as a friendly reminder is basically a see-through robe. Quick side note, I am loving that Sawyer just totally forgot that Violet was sleeping in Dayton's room and he thought that Kat was just showing up for Violet half naked, (laughs) which might, might be foreshadowing because some people, and I would actually throw myself in this category, are theorizing that Kat may be gay or bisexual. I will touch more on this later, but if that is the case, I just, I love this moment. But Kat also posts a list, God fucking damn it cat of all the griffin flyers that mira has taken out over the years which first and foremost that like that right there just signifies how many griffin flyers mira has indeed taken out the fact that it's a list that doesn't mean there's three names on this list that means it's a plethora of names now friendly reminder from fourth wing which i was re-listening to the dramatized version at least part one of it in my free time while i was working on the stretch of chapters it's awesome by the way highly recommend mira when walking to violet's conscription day with violet she was viewed basically as a war hero for taking out a battery behind enemy lines which i would assume killed a lot of flyers that cat wrote on this list the next day we go into the Valley of Erasia, which as a friendly reminder is where all the dragons are hanging out as well, which is why it's a really hot, it's a hot potato in that valley. But while they're waiting for Rune's class to begin, it's mentioned that they've heard from all of the second year second squad's parents, except for Sawyer's family. Could it be that the message didn't make it or that maybe their village was taken over? Like are Basically, are Sawyer's parents alive? Well, Sawyer is from the Lucerus province, which is on the completely opposite side of Navarre and along the coast. Sawyer has also admitted how separated from the rest of society they are. So I wonder if it's far more difficult to have lines of communication with his hometown from Arisha. Plus, it's that much more difficult for them to travel across the kingdom to Arisha. That, that's kind of why I'm thinking maybe just because of the distance there, that's, yeah. it's a lot more difficult for them to all communicate. 
right? Now, regarding Andarna, she states that the elders claim she'll be flying in a few weeks. I assume some of the elders were among the 200 dragons who came from Besgaeth, but for instance, I'm curious if Taryn is the new elder for the Black Dragon Den, since Coda, the Black Dragon Elder, obviously didn't come with them. However, the elders know about Andarna's secret, so I'm going with the OG elders like Coda are the only ones that know. Or maybe there doesn't need to be an elder for every den here because you'd think Taryn would mention being an elder because he'd be all smug about it. Just a little line there that I thought was interesting. Last thing on Andarna for the moment. I find it fascinating how Andarna is not given the same level of, I'll call it dragon respect, as the older dragons receive. Riddick kind of teases her, of course Riddick teases her, saying that the mini Terran is ferocious, which is not something anyone should ever say right in front of a dragon. Remember that sometimes dragons will roast you for just walking too close to them. You don't talk to other dragons and you especially do not tease other dragons. And while yes, this is Riddick, it still goes to show how Andarna is viewed as just a kid versus a big scary dragon. And I'll be honest, Riddick got off easy here because he's lucky to be alive after that encounter. I mean, let's not forget that Indarna is two thirds the size of Segal. Like she is not small by any means. Like there are smaller orange dragons who are smaller than Indarna now. I agree with you. I think Riddick is very lucky to be alive. <laughs> As Professor Tressa comes in, we get the beginning of probably one of the most important downloads we get in this entire book, and that is Rune's class. Now, Lexi is going to go into every inch of runes later on in the archive section today. So we're going to look at this as more of a high level and then we'll go deeper into it later on with explaining runes and the ins and outs of them. But looking at Violet's daggers during runes class, Professor Trissa is like, Violet, you're covered in these rooms. You seriously don't know what these mean. Friendly reminder, Zayden gave her those tearish daggers last year in Fourth Wing, and he wove a rune into every single one of them. And one of those runes is actually the ability to counteract Kat's signet. But what are the other 11 or I guess 10, because we know what one of them is. We know that one of them is unlocking doors with a great need. But there's 10 more that we don't know what they're for. I know, I love to speculate it. I bet that there are other protective runes on her, shielding her maybe from other griffin flyer mind work. Or, I'm going to go a little unhinged here, what if Zayden's mom is a griffin flyer and this counters her mind work that Zayden somehow knows about? Just throwing that out there. Violet does note that one of her daggers has runes very similar to this heating rune power that Professor Trisha performs for them here. So my guess is that one of the daggers has a more complicated version of this heating rune. Maybe her dagger is like an explosive or something. Now I don't hold know, just... on. If it's explosive, Zane fucking should have told her because like <laughs> she could one day just like slam it into a table and then everyone dies. So, like... Or maybe there's another thing there about like the great need. That's he true. almost has it like where it has to activate there which again Zayden give her like a legend here or like a directory of what these runes I just they they do so well with their communication and then something like this happens where it's like come do on they, you guys <laughs> do they though I don't know it's hard to theorize what other possibilities there are with these runes and her daggers because the magic within runes just it really seems to be endless but I do guarantee that these runes on her daggers will play parts in the rest of the series I, I just so excited after giving them their assignment assignment of an unlocking rune, Professor Trissa says every marked one has learned a simple unlocking rune on the first day. What? This was like so brushed over. On the first day of fucking what? And maybe there's like a, an answer that's just plain and clear and in the comments people are going to say this, but to both of us we are baffled by this. On the first day of what? Did the marked ones learn this in order to access a Buzzgaith Forge? That's, that's kind of what guess. my guess is. Yeah. But again, on the first day of what? On their first day of arriving at Arisha, like how we know Liam and Imogen are familiar with Arisha, but they can't leave runes until they've bonded with their dragons because they have to pull the power from their dragons here. So did they learn the basic principles of these runes before they could reach for their own power, before they were bonded, or did they only learn these runes after they bonded with their dragons? Which calls into question, I've asked this question so many times on this podcast, how does a newly bonded marked one like Sloan know this? I'm still so hung up on how the marked ones have such easy access to Arisha and all this knowledge when Arisha is so stinking far away from Biscayeth. 
So my guess is that they start to learn something along the lines of like, you know how Violet was doing the knots and stuff earlier yeah. in this book. So my guess is that they're given the knots and you know how Zayden is like, I can leave every single knot in that book. So maybe they're kind of, that's like step one. And then when they bond with their dragon, they're able to pull things more. And I mean, maybe that's what some of the like meetings under the tree have been in I was going to say like, is Zayden just handing out like homework assignments to the marked points <laughs> fucking hope so i had to call that out because it's like what that 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 line really stopped me in my tracks there same it, it calls into question the whole timeline about how marked ones again sloan is specifically mentioned but she just bonded with her dragon within the past few months well speaking of things that we don't know but were highly alarming we get an alarm second signet moment when they are building a rune for the first time. Violet imagines Taryn's power, but it feels too big, too intimidating, too gargantuan, like I said earlier in Battle Brief, to pull from for this exercise. So instead, she decides that, quote, the pearlescent flow of Andarna's power just beyond the windows feels dot 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 approachable. First off, the flow of Andarna's power. That means she's already channeling to her. Now, remember, you can channel to your writer without them producing a signet. This is how Taryn was channeling to Violet before her signet manifested last year. I'm assuming it's something very similar. So this doesn't mean her second signet from Andarna has manifested before this. So it's my understanding that Taryn and Andarna started channeling power into Violet at the same time last year. I could be wrong, but that was my understanding because because Taryn and Andarna agreed that Violet was ready. And a few hours later, Violet gained power. Again, like Nicole just said, channeling power is different from manifesting a signet. So Violet manifested her signet from Taryn several months after she started channeling that power. Kind of. Oh. She did wield lightning when she kissed Zayden that night. So she did get it pretty instantaneously. She just didn't realize she was doing it until several months later. True. But the point is that it was Taryn's signet power. Yes. I believe the reason that Violet didn't implode from not manifesting her in Darna's signet is because she did manifest hers from Taryn. So that necessary flow of power still occurred and saved Violet from the terrible fate of burnout there before that she could even uh, manifest her signet. Remember how scared she was of that. I could see that. I could see that. There would be no other moment where I'd be like, oh, this is when and Darna finally started channeling to her. Because if you remember, when Taryn started channeling to her, and most likely Taryn and Andarna, Violet was like, she had like a physical reaction. She like dropped to the floor. She couldn't see straight yeah. for a minute. So, and there was no moment like that in, at least to my knowledge, in Iron Flame prior to this moment. The dragon relics, they're like essentially a two-in-one tattoo. So it also makes me wonder if that has anything to do with it. And even during our fourth wing coverage, we speculated if when she started channeling her power, if it was extra intensified, either because of just Terran and his strength and power, or if it was because it was both Taryn and Andarna and that amplified how powerful of a reaction she had yeah oh my gosh well there's a second part of this line from Violet and that is the quote feels approachable if there was ever a moment in this book where we get hey Violet second signet like neon sign right here she's pulling from it it would make sense that it would literally happen right after Violet says her power feels approachable and she reaches for it. So because of that, let's go into what happens right after she reaches for Andarna's approachable power. Quote, steadying my breath, I reach for Andarna's power. Boom, an explosion sounds and my eyes fly open, every head whipping towards Sawyer as he flies backward. A lot of things could have just happened, so let's go into some speculation. Number one, Violet was about to reach for Andarna's power, creating, you know, that suspense for us as readers. And then Sawyer pulled too much power from Sleek and had a Seamus Finnegan moment where he exploded. This would be classic Rebecca Yaros, almost like doing that interruption style of writing, There's which is so prominent in this book where someone's about to drop some really big knowledge and then Violet interrupts them with like that double dash. So something huge is about to happen and then someone cuts them off. This is the act equivalent of that. Number two, Sawyer was pulling from Sleek's power, then had an 
amplifying force causing him to pull too much in that moment, aka this would be a manifestation of Violet's amplification signet, causing him then to have a Seamus Finnegan moment. Or number three, and this is not an exhaustive list. This is at least just what my brain came up with when I was writing this part of the outline. Number three, Sawyer wasn't doing anything and Violet's second signet manifested in the form of a boom, which would kind of mean that she has a boom slash destruction signet. I think given her pure power signet from Tarn, which takes the form of lightning, literally, boom. I think it is safe for us to wave this one off and say, I don't think she's going to get two quote unquote boom signets. Now, this might be one of the biggest clues for us as amplification being her second signet. We don't know what's happening to a writer's power as they're pulling runes, especially for the first time. And, you know, they have their doors to their mental, at least for Violet, it's her mental archives. Like if she's amplifying someone, it would be bursting those doors open, meaning it could easily go Boom. Now, last episode, I talked about the Uno reverse idea for her signet, aka she can basically take anyone's signet and turn around and use it for herself. I also equivalented this to Kirby from Super Smash Bros, where you eat the <laughs> you eat the person you're fighting, poop them out, and then you have their powers for a few minutes. And I will be discussing this in depth again in a few chapters. But no one around her that we know of has a fire boom signet. Re is summoning, Riddick is I and Sawyer is metal bending. However, Professor Trissa is here. We don't know her signet, so it could be an Uno reverse for that. I'm going to have a completely different take on this. Oh, because, okay. Yeah. While I absolutely agree that this approachable reach for Andarna's power is a second signet hint, I wholeheartedly and respectfully disagree that Sawyer's explosion had anything to do with her second signet. And that is because all of them create scorch marks before the day is over. Well, except Kat. There's no other signet being wielded for Violet to amplify. They all go boom at some point. So I think it's just part of the exercise. And yes, I do agree that it was Rebecca kind of diverting our attention away or having us go and chase the shiny objects or the booming objects, so to speak. But I really think that this is more of a small hence signaling to be on the lookout that our second signet has indeed manifested but we aren't seeing it in action yet and in conclusion Sawyer is just being Seamus Finnegan I know we've, we've said that several times but come on does anybody see anything else <laughs> well okay so we don't know if amplification is just for signets it could be for power just in general it could be used with griffin flyers it could be used for creating runes the rune that they are creating is an unlocking rune it's not like a fire rune if this was a fire rune i would be like 100 this is amplification no doubt in my mind however we just don't know i am also going to lean towards this being number one on my list earlier, which was just diverting our attention. And I agree with you, Lex, that it is like a signal of, hey, her second signet has manifested. However, I could also see this being a very big second signet is amplification clue, but the amplification is so much bigger than just signets. I see where you're going with that. Yep. And I am sticking to my guns that this does not have anything to do with explosives. And it's just planting the seed that her second signet is on the horizon unrelated to today's runes class and it is coming soon which again stay tuned for a few chapters well so the last thing I will note here is that Rebecca Yaros has mentioned that the second signet stuff is basically in plain sight on the pages in Iron Flame this is the first moment where she literally reaches for Andarna's power specifically over Terns. what could be more in plain sight than that now this could be the in plain sight of hey she has two dragon power that we're starting to learn about because we've never really heard her reach for Andarna's power prior to this moment. I'll even extend it a little bit further is that she's never even thought about having a second signet because she thought that she had Andarna's power back and forth when, you know, the stopping of time and then that power went away because, you know, and Darna grew up, it's not even on her mind that she will have two powers. And so I think that this might be just a way of reminding the reader, hey, she is going to have two powers because mm. remember, she's pulling for Andarna's power too. Oh, okay. I like that. I do like that. I'm going to stand on the line of it could be amplification or it could be just Rebecca Yaros planting the seed. 
Oh, God. There's so much there. I could talk about it forever. <laughs> but Zayden and Violet have this beautiful moment. You know, we really like on this podcast to pull out the moments of, you know, heightened, intense romance and all this kind of stuff. But we also equally love to pull out the moments of peace and domesticity in Zayden and Violet's relationship. And don't get me wrong. I love the passion. I love the heated moments. I love when she pulls down her hair in the shower and they fuck on the tiles. But in the scene where she's working on her homework and he's getting dressed for the day, it just makes me smile. I love how Violet even notices, quote, I smile at the domesticity of it. She like sees how they have their uniforms in the same closet. And she's like, oh, like, you know, when you first move in with a partner and you're just like, oh, like, this is so great. I just I love this for them. However, we do start learning that this momentary happiness is missing some elements like Violet feeling like she can honestly ask Satan questions, even though he is literally saying, ask me anything you want. Now I have my squabbles with Satan over him being like, ask me the right questions and I'll tell you the answers. And it's like, bitch, you could also just tell her the answers. Why do you have to, why do you have to have that extra step? That's just inefficient. Now she is afraid to ask these questions because she's worried about it ruining their happiness. She's terrified to ask Satan about the deal he made with her mother because she doesn't want to have anything disrupt this little happy bubble rainbows and butterflies that they're in but I would argue that is it true happiness rainbows and butterflies if you don't feel fully secure that is a good question I learned that in therapy thank you (laughs) in the stretch we learn a lot more about runes honestly this is just the runes stretch of chapters that we get here we get a little bit in the next episode as well but speaking of these runes Colonel Mari the goddess among us Colonel Mari we need to walk through this brilliant rune that she created. She created a one-time only use rune, meaning that Zayden Stone that's sitting next to his bed with a super complicated rune on it is basically dormant and useless. But this rune is not just for the protection of anyone. No, this rune and the 107 others that were made, this rune specifically on Zayden's nightstand was made to protect someone of Fen Ryerson's bloodline. And this rune was designed to counter the signet of the writer who killed the bloodline members. So basically Coda and General Melgren obviously killed Fen Ryerson. So this rune counteracts the signet from Coda and General Melgren. Now let's walk through the moment that Fen died. Fen died. Zayden and all of the other marked ones had this rune stone closed around their fist. Heat raced up his arms just like the relic burning their backs at threshing to get their tattoo. But this one activated the rune and turned it into the rebellion relics. This is why it always starts on their arm and like weaves up. You know Garrick and Zayden have the biggest rebellion relics apparently which we still don't know why some are bigger than others. I'm guessing Maybe it has to deal with rank because I can't remember if his mom or his dad, but wasn't one of Garrick's parents Fen's second? Yes, because as Zayden described it to Violet, Garrick is his Dane, but trustworthy. Womp. (laughs) Now we have to talk about these 107 rebellion relic children. So Zayden is the oldest of all of these and Julianne is the youngest. She, we assume, is now seven. She was six during Fourth Wing. However, she was born with the rebellion mark. One of the most popular questions I'd say we get is how would a six-year-old Julianne have a rebellion relic if she was in the womb when activated? I've got some theories. (laughs) Number one, what if Julianne is actually the granddaughter of the person who was killed. So what if the child of the rebel was actually holding the stone and they were pregnant and it also marked the baby, which would mean that if Zayden and Violet had a child, they might also have a rebellion relic because it gets passed down through generation or it might just mark the people who are physically holding it at the time of incineration. So that's number one. I'm leaning towards that one. However, I've got some dark theories too. (laughs) So one of my dark theories is that Julianne was a child of two rebel parents Rebel parent number one died of dragon fire and rebel parent number two, the pregnant parent, was made to watch and held the rebellion relic stone during the incineration. After birthing the baby, parent number two was also put to death, just like Liam's parents were, but one was formal, one was informal and elsewhere. So that could also be a possibility. But again, no matter what, it would be pregnant person is holding the rebellion relic stone and thus it transferred onto the baby in the womb. That's my guess. I mean, 
it because straight up it none of it makes sense like how would that happen so that is going to be my guess yeah from our perspective this information dump about colonel mari and the protective runes and the rebellion relics it debunks the marked one second signet theory remember that many of us thought that the marked ones had a second signet from their rebellion relic we talked a lot about this in our fourth wing coverage i shared that this theory is debunked on the instagram stories and i was actually very surprised that it opened up quite the can of worms mainly what about Liam wielding ice? It's a good question. A lot of fans wonder if it was an editing error in Fourth Wing because we know that there was also a third year wielding ice in the Resin battle, which I would be inclined to agree with, except Liam's Dragon Day literally translates to ice. That is not an editing error if Liam was wielding ice and his dragon's name means ice. So yes, there was another third year who was wielding ice, but Liam was as well. I am going to go with an unhinged theory that Liam was also a direct descendant of Day's previously bonded writer, and he uniquely also had a second signet. I'm thinking he shared this in his letters to Sloane, and that is how Sloane seems to be the only one who knows that when this happens, you either get a second signet or go mad because her brother literally explained that's what happened to him. Another possibility is that Day passed his own ice wielding power into Liam. We don't know if that was Day's power. Again, Day equals ice, so maybe that's a hint to Day's power. We haven't seen any other dragon aside from Indarna do that, and we don't know how that could be possible with these older dragons, but I had to throw it out there that maybe Day passed that through to Liam there. Here's one thing I will also say is that when Violet in chapter 56 is starting to guess Zayden's second signets, she starts to eliminate them, and she says, you're not an element wielder or else you would have done that at the Battle of Resin. And it's like, oh, <laughs> oh my God. Oh. <laughs> so if that's not a neon sign right there that Liam also is a direct descendant of whoever Day previously bonded, which it could have been Colonel Mari. Remember, she is a dragon rider because she can weave these really complicated fucking runes. Or if that means it was a grandmother, grandfather, so on and so forth. But that right there cements for me that yes, he also had this gift. I'm going to go with it wasn't Colonel Mari just because that would have been a huge red flag to leadership if his rebellion mother's dragon also bonded with Liam. Like, I feel like that would have come up at some point in Fourth Wing. But but maybe, yeah, somebody further back in his ancestry, but still a direct descendant. So anyway, so those are just our thoughts. We understand that a lot of people do still stick to the theory that the Marked Ones have second signets. To us, this right here is the explanation about why all the Marked Ones have their rebellion relics. And it's really cool how it is something... None of us would have imagined because, hey, we didn't know about runes in the first book. Ugh. So good. <laughs> so we also get another Zayden doesn't have a sibling mention. I have been clocking these like crazy during our for honestly fourth wing and definitely our Iron Flame read because there are so many nudges and I am convinced that Zayden has a sibling. However, in other episodes, I've speculated that Zayden has a half sibling through his mother. But in this instance, it says Zayden is Fen Ryerson's only child. So I do have two more options that I want to throw into the mix. And honestly, I think I like these more than Zayden's mom has a second child with a different person. Number one, Fen Ryerson had a child after Zayden's mom left with another woman that he hid from Zayden. I'm meh on this one or number two Bodhi is actually Zayden's brother slash half brother the amount of mentions that we get where Bodhi looks just like Zayden is way too sus how you might ask because Bodhi's mom is Fen's sister well (laughs) if Fen and his sister had a Lannister moment aka (laughs) they were more than siblings if you know what I mean Bodhi would actually be Zayden's brother slash half brother really and this would be another reason why Fen and Zayden's mother's marriage was a loveless one but we do know that his mother or maybe that he just looked more like Fen but it's all of this is focused on his mom because there's so much saying that Bodhi looks just like his mom well Lannister moment like I'm telling you if like like watch the plot twist be that Fen Ryerson and I can't remember his sister's name but Fen Ryerson and Bodhi's mom were actually closer than siblings if you know what I mean now Bodhi is one year younger than Zayden so they wouldn't have been twins unless it was just a lie to like make it less suspicious I don't know but if not twins Zayden wouldn't really remember his mother or someone 
around him being pregnant at one years old. Here's another option I'm going to throw out there. Fen and his wife, Zayden's mom, actually did have a second child together, aka Bodhi, and Bodhi's mom ended up raising her almost a surrogate moment is what I'm is what I'm leaning towards. But to your point, Lex, like Bodhi does look a lot like his mother. So I don't think it's that. I think maybe there might have been a Lannister moment. I'm kind of leaning I, there. No way. Like I <laughs> like no way. There are way too many moments where Bodhi is mentioned looking exactly like Zayden. And also, Zayden doesn't have a sibling. Zayden, I always used to wish I had siblings. Da, 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 all these different things. And while, yes, I still think that definitely it could be something on his mom's side where he she had a second child after Fen, after she left when Zayden was 10, so on and so forth. But I'm just throwing ideas I, out there. That's still my number one, is that his mom did end up having another child after she had left. And when we meet her later on in the series, I assume that we are going to meet her later oh, in the yeah. series, that is, we are also going to meet Zayden's half sibling as well and that's going to add extra conflict in or because you know Bodhi is mentioned to look so much like his mom something like her, his smile looks just like her smile well she was Finn Ryerson's sister so maybe it is actually he looks a lot like Finn and just he would never put two and two together and so it is actually Finn Ryerson's son and Bodhi's mother slash Finn's sister did adopt. I don't know if I'm going with Lannister moments. That's too much in fantasy. Too too much of a duplicate there. I'm really leaning into Bodhi being a sibling of Zayden's. Whether that's a half sibling or a full sibling, I don't know. But if it was just one mention of how much Bodhi looks like Zayden, that would be one thing. But there have been so many mentions where I'm like, that's too sus. Maybe it's not a Lannister moment. I could definitely see Fen and his wife having a second child and just like, you know, Fen's sister raising said child. I could totally see that. I could also see a Lannister moment. I could see it being because Zayden's mother, she did this out of duty. So if she did have another son, then she didn't want to stay an extra year or she was already like, no, I already had my one. Like I'm one and done, you know? And that is when then Fen's sister did say, okay, well, I will take the other child and I will... I will take him under my wing. That is what I am leaning towards here. Okay. That's a lot less weird. <laughs> That's a lot less weird. I will also just throw out as someone who had children back to back a year after another, if they are siblings and whoever had them back to back, shouts to you, mom, because I went through that too. And it is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> now, remember, Zayden was born in March. So he is on the younger side of his year. Now, we don't know... If, what if him and Bodhi are twins and they just like no. held Bodhi back a little bit? I'm getting no. into unhinged. You are really <laughs> getting into unhinged territory here. Oh my gosh. Have you been watching Game of Thrones again, Nicole? Have I you haven't. been watching it without me? <laughs> I haven't, but honestly, I'm due for a rewatch soon. Minus season oh seven and eight. Everything up until then. But let's get into the sparring moment away from my unhinged theory land and... I want to ask you, Lexi, what are your thoughts on this assignment that Immaterio and Devera are giving them? Where it's basically like, beat the shit out of each other today. Get your grievances out, whatever, because tomorrow you're going to be squad mates, most likely. What are your thoughts? Smart, stupid? Oh, I'll say it's certainly a different approach than the Cliffs of Drailer expedition. I think it's both smart and stupid. It's essentially the opposite of approach as the hiking expedition. And I'll argue that it is one that will work a little bit better than hiking 12 hours together. Because think about who their audience is. It's, you know, griffin flyers and dragon riders who are already trained fighters who have a lot against each other. So yeah, let them duke it out on the mat. I think that this is definitely a little bit more of a short term solution, like just needing to let the water boil over before moving forward. But you know, we kind of do see it work between Violet and Kat later on in this book, sort of. Not in this moment, we don't. But <laughs> No, here, gosh, no. <laughs> here's my thoughts. Like, much like the hike, I agree with the end result, the end goal they're wanting to achieve. But the method seems like it's leaning more into divisive than, you know, let's hold hands and sing Kumbaya. Does that mean I have another option? No, absolutely not. I don't. But I will say the cave exercise seemed to do the trick later on in this book. Now, whether that was just because there was enough time, whether that was because they've been squad mates for a while, because they literally can't kill each other under the codex, so they have that option automatically taken off the table. Maybe it was, you know, the imminent death of Solus. I don't know. Well, so I will say that the cave exercise, that wasn't necessarily an exercise of griffin flyers versus dragon riders and, and trying to make it like an and unit, I think that the cave exercise could not have happened 
if this didn't happen. So, you know, I'm going to go with yes. Like, again, given the audience, this is the better solution than hiking 12 hours together. I think they should have had some parameters. Like, they should have looked at Cat and Violet's streak and been like, that's maybe one we will not let happen on the mat. But then, that again, it's just going to keep bubbling over. And it's just like, just let them have it out together. Got to let the water boil. I, I See, that's the thing. I don't have another solution. But I don't know <laughs> if Violet and Cat's fight helped anyone in this situation. I mean, it helped Violet learn from Zayden later because if she hadn't had that, you know, emotions boil over because of Kat, she wouldn't have learned that her daggers, because Zayden doesn't fucking tell her anything. He doesn't tell her that her daggers counteract Kat's gift. I don't know. I'm going with it was smart and stupid. I'm going to agree with you, but I agree with the end result. I don't like the journey there. But I love this. We do see Violet's mind start to work like she did during her Poison Master era last year. She mentions lamenting that she didn't lace Kat cat's breakfast woof with funnily berries now if these sound familiar they should because during violet's midnight poison master scheming during fourth wing she was collecting funnily berries when she ran into zayden in his under the tree moment with the marked ones chat this is brilliant from rebecca yaros connecting us with something tied to zayden right before both of these ladies realize oh shit he trained us both also fun fact this moment under the tree was a moment when zayden read her intentions knowing that she was not going to tattletale and that's when he started to i won't say trust her but that's when he trusted her at least not to tell on the marked ones so again i just loving i love bringing up that moment again because this is now i think the second or maybe even the third time in this book that they bring up this moment right before our chapter 56 big reveal. Devera, she needs to learn some semantics because she says no weapons, no signets. Flyers technically don't have signets, they have gifts. I can't believe I'm saying this. Technically, Kat didn't break the rules. <laughs> like she said, no weapons, no signets. So technically, Kat did not break the rules here. And I cannot believe I just stood up for Kat. Ugh. Boo. I, it's the same thing. And I'll also say because they are technically in like a writer's quadrant here in Arisha that the writers are absorbing the Griffin Flyers. It's like, yeah, they are going to be considered signets. But I do agree with you. Devera and Emeterio or whoever is saying this needs to say no magic because there was that confusion also back in fourth wing too with Emogen using her lesser power of speed that has been mistaken as her second signet. Ugh, I miss Imogen. I miss her so where much. Where is my girl? Yeah, where is she? <laughs> Your girl's just like absent in part two. It's kind of a bummer. She wiped all of our memories and just, <laughs> just fled the scene. Now, before we get into the big fight scene between Kat and Violet, we have to talk about the opening for chapter 47 because it is describing all the ranks of Venon. Let's walk through them together. The lowest level of Venon are initiates. They have reddish rings to their eyes and the red comes and goes depending on how often they channel from the source. This is the level that Zayden and most likely Jack are in. Then we have Asims. Their eyes fluctuate in degrees of red and when they're riled up, their veins distend red. This is the level of venom Violet fought in fourth wing on Taryn's back. Next up, we have Sages. They are responsible for the initiates and their eyes are permanently red. Also, they have permanent veins that distend toward their temples. The only absolutely confirmed sage we know of is from Resin, the staff man. He's also the one in Violet's dreams, and he is the sage who arrives on the Tyrandor border with all of the wyvern in chapter 56. Based on his maroon robes and description, we can also guess that the captured venon in Corden was also a sage. Lastly, we have the maven, who are also considered the generals, and we don't know jack shit about them other than Zayden fought and supposedly killed one at the end of Iron Flame. I'm going to go with... I highly doubt he is actually dead. Can't fool me twice, Rebecca. I will cry laughing if this dude is actually dead. <laughs> if you're like, like he can't be. He can't be. <laughs> I also do not think he is dead, but I don't know. I will die laughing if he actually is dead. That would be so funny. With that epigraph now in our noggins, we move into Cat and Violet's fight. And wow, Cat really sucks during this stretch. Just to pull out a few god fucking damn it cat moments. She asks if it bothers Violet knowing that she, Kat, knows what Zayden tastes like and how his 
weight feels on top of her. Like this alone fucking right here is enough to make me hate her. Also note here that Violet says, quote, but shit, if that picture doesn't play out in my mind as vividly as a nightmare. Again, connecting the word nightmare to Zayden, probably nothing, but just pointing that out. But of course, Cat, God fucking damn it, Cat, goes on mentioning how she belongs here, how she's a much better match for him in every way, and how he's going to get tired of Violet's, quote, frail excuse of a body, and then go back to Cat. How on earth did Cat have even a slight redemption arc in this book? Like, I don't hate Cat at the end of this book, but woof. That's impressive. I do think that that's a a testament to Rebecca Yaros's writing in the last few chapters of the book to make us start to open up to Kat. I'm not going to say forgive her or start to like her, but start to open up to her. And then, of course, saying that Violet is nothing special and she's just a convenient placeholder for him to fuck. Wow, God fucking damn it, Kat, you suck so much. She's definitely projecting her own emotions onto Violet. Zayden wasn't capable of loving her. And even though she was in it for the crown, seeing Zayden madly in love with someone else who isn't worthy in Kat's eyes makes her go crazy ex-girlfriend. I'm not saying I get it because she is absolutely off the rails here, but like, wow, her own emotional projections onto Violet are just so in your face. I love this moment on a reread because while Violet is like gaze is locked on cat, they're in their cat fight, literally. Someone on the edge of the mat says, quote, are you going to do something about this? And then a voice says, quote, she wouldn't want me to. Hello, Zayden. Nice to see ya. So we as readers, and this is early on in the fight, we as readers now know on a reread how he has been here literally the entire time. I know he says it later, but we see literally how entire time he's been here for this fight, hearing literally everything. Woof. Now in this fight, Kat asks Violet mockingly, quote, do you know why he didn't kill you that first year? And Violet thinks that Kat is mentioning the deal with Lilith. I'm not so sure. Do you think that Zayden actually told Kat about the deal with Lilith? No, but I do think that is what she's referring to. But no, I do not think that Zayden told Kat because he broke things off with Kat before Violet officially entered the writer's quadrant. I do think he may have explained himself to someone like Serena when he didn't take Violet for the ransom. Marin, remember, commented that they were shocked he protected Violet instead. So Zayden might have explained why to someone. Again, he's not a explain why kind of guy, but to someone who he trusts an ally like Serena, he might have. Anyway, that's my best guess. And then Serena is the one who told Kat. I actually disagree I think that she does not know anything about the deal with Lilith and this is just her trying to convey and pretend like she knows more about Zayden then so I I do think that this is a bit of a fib is what I'm saying I think that's absolutely possible because that's (laughs) totally something Kat would do lord ain't that the truth so as we're talking so much about Kat and how much she sucks like a lot I want to bring in Rebecca Yaros's thoughts on Kat and what she is supposed to represent because I believe that this does add necessary context to better understand why Kat is the way that she is. A lot of us finished reading Iron Flame when the Variety article came out just several days later, and a lot of us were like, wow, who is this character Kat? Just like super in our faces. Like I I was... I have a lot of feelings about her character portrayal in this book. And after reading Rebecca Yaros's explanation, I understood it a little bit more. Now, as I've mentioned, do I absolutely agree with the way that it was conveyed? Yeah, maybe not so much, but I understand where she's coming from. So I'm just going to quote this whole section from the Variety article because she says it way better than I ever could. All right, so the question is, what is the purpose of Zayden's ex, Catriona? What did you want to do with that character and why did you want to introduce her now? And Rebecca's response is, so I want to introduce her now because I want everyone to see where the Griffin Flyers come from. But also, I want them to see Catriona's not out to get Violet just because she loves Zayden or because they had this relationship. She's out for the power. And if it was a man pulling that power move it would be just that a power move and they wouldn't be called caddy so I'm interested to see how the readers react because I want to see where the feminism in there plays off she flat out says you think that this is about a man this is about a crown and any man in that situation would absolutely take another man to task over winning that crown that is Rebecca's response and her explanation of Kat and her whole character in a sense I agree, sort of. I will say if a guy on these pages was doing exactly what Kat is doing, just 
it's a man instead of Catriona. I would think he was an unhinged, crazy dickwad. Like, I don't think I would say anything nicer. Just be like, oh, well, that's just a man out for power. I would be like, this guy needs to calm down. Like, this is ridiculous. Now, if it was a man acting in, I'll say, a very major air quotes, traditional power hungry male way on these pages, aka challenging people to fights and you know like uh, in like that fantasy guy way Th- the unfortunate thing is yeah I probably wouldn't blink many eyes or I wouldn't have as strong of feelings towards it so I do agree with her on that front however if it was the exact same actions exact same wording however it was just a man portrayed instead of cat I would feel very similarly whether it was a man or a woman or anyone else yeah, and again, like we, we've talked about this so much, so I won't go too into it, but I think we signed the reactions video where it was like, Kat was dialed up to like a level 20 when I needed her at like a level 13. Well, speaking of things that are a level 20, my heart rate, <laughs> let's get into the throne scene the scene that made the fandom rise a rallying cry my house my chair my woman but first i'm gonna douse some cold water on you for just two seconds here first the epigraph note that this epigraph is public notice 628.86 the opening epigraph to this book iron flame was public notice 628.85 so that was the one right before this one and it states that tyrandor's power has been transferred from house ryerson to house House Llewellyn. The only thing we know about House Llewellyn is that they are actually on the side of the rebellion. Wait, what? That was such a tiny little nugget in this stretch of chapters. In fact, it was actually this exact chapter that it was stated, quote, but Llewellyn's on our side and doing just fine at governing the province. So we have speculated if some of the quote unquote loyal Navarre Tirandor families are actually secretly siding with the revolution. And this right here shows that, yes, that is correct. And House Llewellyn is indeed with the revolution, but they're playing double agent. Now, I do wonder that when the time comes, do you think Llewellyn is going to give up the power for House Ryerson to rise up again? That's a great question. It is. I don't know the answer, but it's worth pondering. Now, before we get into the juicy stuff that I am foaming at the mouth to get to, Rebecca Yaros mentioned that she had this scene plotted, the throne scene, very early in her plotting for the book because she wanted to show the reader that there was absolutely no chance of a love triangle or that Zayden still had feelings for Kat and the fandom rejoiced. Zayden says in response to Violet's quote, she wants you for your name. He says, quote, and you love me in spite of it. That is one of the many reasons I will always choose you. I personally think that this came... (laughs) wink across <laughs> <laughs> really well in the story because there is no chance in my head that Zayden would ever choose someone else other than Violet even before the throne scene but I mean I'm not mad about the throne scene being included. Now, one other note, I heard Rebecca say in an interview that her editor had originally tried to have her dial back some of the sex scenes in this book. And she was extremely adamant about keeping these three in it. Now, of course, absolutely the throne scene. I believe I've actually read that this particular scene was not one of the ones that her editor had asked her to remove. But Rebecca really had to fight for all of the spiciness that was in this book. And the reason why she did is because she said she likes to write what she loves to read and she's like I'm a romance writer I'm a romance reader and I love to read this kind of stuff so of course I'm going to write it so that's just a fun interesting little tidbit that I learned from watching one of her interviews oh I love that thank god she fought for it because those three they make my heart happy it's so funny to see everybody like everybody has different opinions on the spice level of this book and it's especially on reddit when like 30 something year old guys come on and they're like I thought this was a book about dragons (laughs) (laughs) everyone in the comments is like oh you sweet child this is called romanticy (laughs) my favorite is there's that like viral tiktok sound right now that's like I'm reading about dragons I'm reading about smut I'm and then the very last part of it I'm reading about dragons fucking each other (laughs) it's just like and it's of course everyone puts down the book fourth wing at that moment it's so funny it's so true I have not seen that why have we not done a video on that yes (laughs) we need to do a video on that it's so funny now I will say of all the spicy scenes that we have in both fourth wing and iron flame I don't think the throne scene is my favorite because The very end of this and how Zayden reacts, and we're going to get into Mm -hmm. every single nuance of that, really took me out of it. Because, like, they're not all snuggly or even, like, flirty afterwards. Like, he is 
shaken and weird. I honestly think my favorite is chapter, I think it's 30 in fourth wing, which is the first time they sleep together. In case you needed my personal ranking. <laughs> hey, the internet does want to know. <laughs> no, there, maybe someday I'll do a full blown spice scene ranking of all the fourth wing spicy scenes. All right. But Zayden, back to the scene, is one smart freaking cookie. He says, quote, nothing I could say right now is going to erase her, cat's words from your head. So sit, violence. We'll do the talking afterward. I love that afterward. <laughs> and the funny thing is that every single reader, the second he started rearing and a-going, instantly forgot about cat as well. <laughs> like, it was such a meta line because it's, it is accurate. I was not thinking about cat in the slightest. And of course, we get the six words that rose up the romanticy reader fandom that we've become. My house, my chair, my woman. I've even got a sticker. You can kind of see it YouTube. I've got a sticker of my house, my chair, my woman from one of our mods on Discord. Thank you, Brooke. I appreciate you. We'll put the link in the show notes to that sticker as well, which thank you, Brooke, for designing it. It's perfect. This line right here, my house, my chair, my woman, is the perfect possessive dominance that we as romanticy readers love to see. But I also love how this is tying everything Zayden works for. Erasia, his crown to Violet, of course, the biggest thing he works for above all else. I love it. But I also want to note that some people speculate that Zayden and Violet will end up being king and queen, whether that's of Navarre or of Tyrandor if they secede, and they'll end up being the king and queen of Eratia. But they think this mainly because they think that this line is here to then foreshadow a future line of my palace, my throne, my queen, which I'm not going to lie. Ooh, I just got <laughs> wouldn't be mad about. <laughs> Do I think that's going to happen? I don't know. I don't think I have enough information to make a solid guess, but would I be mad about it? Nope. No, I wouldn't. Now, a few episodes ago, I mentioned how I love in books when a girl goes down on a guy simply because of their like loss of control, their bucking of their hips, their neck arching back. But a guy going down on a girl is a different it hits different. That is a different experience. Every description of this scene is delicious pun intended. Like how many people after reading this scene were like, hey, partner of mine, I need you to read a very specific chapter from this book and like slides the book across the table. I think Brett and I, we were listening to the scene and he was sitting on the couch. I think we were like eating lunch or something. He was sitting on the couch. I was on our bar stools and we were just like chilling, like kind of separately. And I look over and his He's not eating. He's staring into the distance. His face is tomato red. And I was like, how's your food, honey? And he goes, I am distracted. <laughs> and then I won't tell you what happened afterward. <laughs> my husband was just out of town and he encouraged me to read my favorite spicy chapters because, you know, he's always like, oh, yeah, I see you in your spicy books. And oh uh, yes, I believe that we are both specifically thinking of this one. He has not read it, but he is very familiar with this throne scene that we are all talking about. <laughs> now here's another common book theme. Zayden is kneeling before her and says through their bond, quote, is this what you think about when I'm away? My mouth between your soft thighs. Like this one line causes me to stop breathing, kick my legs up in the air like a little girly that I am. Like, I don't know what it is about whenever guys are like away or something like that. And then they come back and they do something like this to their partner. And it's like, is this what you think about when I'm away? Like, I don't know what it is about. Or like, I mean, I know that there's a very specific scene in another, you Universe where it's like, is this what you think about at night? I don't know what it is about that one line, but it just, it always stands out to me and makes me a little extra giddy. But we need to take a moment of appreciation for every beat of this particular part of the scene. Zayden says, quote, Look where you are. Look at how beautiful you are, Violet, coming for me on Tyrandor's throne. This is highly possible foreshadowing to me. Violet is sitting and coming on the Eurasian throne. We've speculated that this is not the last time she will be sitting on the throne. I speculated about it just a minute ago. Now, does that mean she's like the queen of Eurasia or just the duchess? I'm leaning more towards duchess because I don't know about Tyrandor succeeding. I don't really know about all that. But I love here that Zayden is also kneeling before her, obviously for many reasons. I love that. But it, for the symbolism, like if she is on the throne and he is kneeling before her, that is some highly possible foreshadowing right there as well. I've written a love letter to Smut on this podcast and I'm about to write another one. But this is Smut Love Letter Female Empowerment Edition. From a young age, women are generally taught that they need to look a certain way and act a certain way, which 
which the looks not only lead to body dysmorphia and other hardships, but it also leads to a massive amount of insecurity in the bedroom, feeling like the lights need to be off or dark or dimmed in order for them to feel better about being bare and seen in front of their partner. Now, also feeling self-conscious when all of the partner's attention is on them. And because women generally tend to feel guilty and selfish here, it tends to also lead to feeling guilty and selfish in the bedroom and these moments. I mean, even Violet says that she feels weird not reciprocating. While this is not only women who experience this, this can be any one of any gender, it does tend to be more prominent in those who identify as women. However, studies show those who are non-binary and transgender do experience this highly as well. Moments like this in books where just the female partner is laid bare, spread wide, and completely on display, but also being the center of attention and their partner loving the sight that they're beholding, this feels so empowering to read as a woman who in the past has felt very insecure having their partner's full undivided attention on her. It reminds me that your partner loves seeing you like this and even that extra vulnerability and being laid completely bare can be wildly attractive and not something to shy away from. So again, smut, thank you very, very much for not only reminding me that sex is something that can be on our minds and celebrated as women, but also reminding me that being vulnerable, completely on display and the center of attention can be wildly hot and empowering. I love your smut letters. I love them too. You know what? It, they make me happy. <laughs> so pivoting ever so slightly, one word that did stand out to me during the scene, I mean, let me just be clear, a lot of words <laughs> stood out to me, but one word for other reasons, quote, he, Zaynan, lifts his head, keeping me in a suspended state of indescribable bliss. And I was like, huh, I wonder where else we see this word suspended in this book. From Zayden, when discussing the ribosod chest at Corden in Violet's last two dreams, when the venom is suspending her in air, taking away her gravity, and Zayden's dream slash memory when he is suspended, aka his gravity is taken away. AKA it's always associated with venom in some way. Now, whether this is foreshadowing for something that we don't know about or connecting Zayden to the venom, which obviously we get in the last part of this book, Zayden turning venom, which can't wait to talk about that chapter. I'm leaning towards the latter personally, but I just thought that was such a cool word choice to tie Zayden into Venon and that suspended nature right there. So moving into the reason why the throne scene is not my number one smut scene in the Empyrean series, because while this is a wildly hot and very empowering and awesome scene, there is a huge moment that happens that quite frankly, gives me and many other readers, including Lexi, quite a bit of pause. As Violet is ramping up for her big finale, quote, shimmering onyx wraps around my mind and everything intensifies. And she starts to hear Zayden's thoughts. This causes her to go completely over the edge. And then something super weird happens. Zayden is standing, quote, three feet and a million miles away from Violet and is white knuckling the edge of the assembly table. And he is flipping distressed. Yeah, we need to talk about what the hell happened here because there is a lot to unpack. So first of all, let's be clear. This was not just Zayden talking into their mind-to-mind bond. They do that all the time and he never would have had this kind of reaction. Also, of course, the way that he's talking, it is very clearly his thoughts in his own head, not his thoughts talking to her into her head. Also, this isn't a guy trying to keep his composure. Think of baseball moment. Every way Zayden is acting right now screams alarm, alarm. Like what? This is a very strange incident. Zayden, we have never seen Zayden like this before. So here are some options that we're leaning towards this being. Number one, Zayden's intrinsic power slipped in a way he has never experienced before. He mentions later that because of their bond, it is easier for him to read her thoughts and for her to send her intentions down the pathway. This could have been a moment where his power reached a whole new level. Later on, he says, quote, I should not have done that. I should not have done that. This is something he did, whether that was knowingly or unconsciously, but it came originally from him. We need to remember that intrinsics are always 
killed. So Zayden has no one to help guide him into what is possible and what is not possible as his signet grows, as he hones it even more as an adult writer. Because of this, he might easily not only be able to read minds, but also slip into other minds as well. I think about it like him being able to use mind work to whether that's influence others or in this moment, let someone else hear his own thoughts. Also later, Violet is praising him for what he just did, like calling it the hottest experience she's ever had. And he says, please don't. And the word please really shocks Violet. Like she kind of like stops for a minute. He is hiding his intrinsic nature and later begs Violet to stop guessing signets so that he doesn't have to tell her. He is deeply ashamed of this signet and he does not want anyone to know. So the word please here really makes it sound like he's not wanting her to go further down the line of this thinking because he is terrified of her finding out and him slipping here. Also, later in this conversation, Violet says, why are you so keen on torturing yourself? It seems like she has concluded that Zayden is being weird because his balls are going to turn blue. When I've read this scene, especially this particular part, several times and trying to figure out what in the world it could be, one of the conclusions is that he really does have blue balls and he is trying to push her away. But that's not how Zayden and Violet's relationship is. And right after she asks him about why is he trying to torture himself, he exhales just a shade short of a sigh. It's almost like he's relieved that she didn't press him further, like Nicole was just saying about she just got a peek into his intrinsic ability, but she doesn't realize it. And then way later in this conversation, Zayden says, Violet, you were just in my thoughts. Thoughts. That is a very key word there. Now, it's not intentions, but it is thoughts, which in fact, I would go ahead and say it was his intentions because it's very thin line of semantics there. Now, the big question with this is, how does this work? How does being an intrinsic like him work? And the answer we have is intensives can read others' minds, not project their mind into others, unless they are far more powerful when, you know, you let them live. So again, this could just be us learning more about Zayden's intrinsic power or Zayden even learning more about his own intrinsic power without us knowing it because that big reveal hasn't occurred yet. But just to cover our bases, let's go into another option, option two. This very well could be a Violet Uno reverse signet moment. In case you missed it, last episode, Lexi and I brought up the possible second signet where Violet basically reflects the signets of those around her. We kind of covered it earlier in the episode as well. We know that her signet last year manifested while she was kissing Zayden for the first time. We also know that anytime they are in the heat with each other, she wields lightning. Like it's not abnormal for her to wield in some form or fashion when she and Zayden are having a sexual moment. Violet for a moment might have taken in this instance taken on the signet as an intrinsic. There's also this line right before he starts speaking into her mind, quote, shimmering onyx wraps around my mind. Now there have been multiple moments where, quote, his voice wraps around my mind when he speaks into their bond. But this is the only time in both books where it's shimmering onyx wraps around her mind. Could this be that the shimmering onyx is his signet power in this way? And the wording there is just to show us that she is absorbing his power in that moment in her mind. Also later it says, quote, he untangles from my mind. Their bond is never described in that way where he needs to untangle from her mind. If this is the case, I don't think Zayden knows it was her using an Uno reverse signet. I think especially because intrinsic powers are so unknown, he thinks this is some new element to it that he's like, oh my God. Hence the, I shouldn't have done that and all the other points we mentioned earlier. Because the quote, you were just in my thoughts, he would be freaking the fuck out times a million if he thought that she was, I mean, for lack of a better term, an intrinsic too, because he wouldn't know the difference in this moment if she was an intrinsic versus if she was an Uno reverse signet reflector. This would also be so typical Rebecca Yaros writing, making us think it was Zayden and his mind signet and almost foreshadowing for his intrinsic abilities, but nope. It was actually Violet who was manifesting in this moment. Also, this is after the runes class where Violet was saying that she was pulling from Andarna's power, making us think about a second signet as a possibility. A third possibility, just to throw it out there, is that Violet's second signet is a type of intrinsic. Is it possible? Sure. 
Does she need information? Yes. But remember, she doesn't need it in the same way that Zayden does, which manifested his second signet as an intrinsic. Also, too intrinsic, it doesn't scream the twists and turns of the story. Now, if it's a different type of intrinsic, I would be fascinated to learn about that. But I'm leaning more towards it actually being more that reflection signet over a another type of intrinsic. I agree with that. Yeah. And there are so many other possibilities that we could dive into too with this. And we'll keep touching on them a little bit more throughout the stretch. And we will definitely refer back to this scene as we continue speculating what Violet's second signet is. But Nicole, let's go ahead. Let's dive into our thoughts about what this scene really does mean. I know we've kind of shared it, but let's wrap it up with a bow. So prior to writing this part of the outline, I was convinced this was an Uno reverse reflection second signet moment from Violet. And I'm still leaning that way personally. I think this is because the Uno reverse signet is becoming the front runner for me in terms of second signets, at least for now. I was listening to the end of this audiobook and I heard a very convincing moment for distance wielding, which I will get into when we cover the battle later on in our episodes. But mainly because this is kind of a chameleon signet. And with Andarna basically being a chameleon dragon den, she can blend herself into any other color that she wants. It feels very poetic. Also very, I'm Violet and I can do anything others can do. And that's, you know, that badass nature of hers. This is at least my front runner for now. But all of this to say, when I started writing the argument for this being a Zayden intrinsic power growing in new ways, I started opening up my mind to that more and more. And again, because they keep killing every flipping intrinsic, we never know what their powers can be when they're honed. So because of this, I definitely see that being part of the argument too. And basically, yet again, I went into this with a certain mindset and through my own style of writing, I convinced myself of a different line of thinking. I will say because of the shimmering onyx, I am leaning more towards this being the Uno reverse moment. No matter what, I do think it. Zayden thinks it was him but I don't think that it was Zayden. I 100% agree with you on that. And I do believe that this moment is a sign of Violet's second signet. I love the idea that it is actually Zayden's intrinsic ability, kind of like getting new untapped powers. And now that you've actually shared that, I'm that's a really, really strong argument. But if it is Violet's second signet or a hint of it, it would be so fitting because right before this was a scene where she pulls for Andarna's power. And like we were saying, it showed a hint of her second signet coming to life. I'm leaning more and more toward her second signet being like a chameleon, what you were just saying, where she can wield what she needs to in the moment, which is different from the Uno reverse. If this was her second signet, then I have to believe there are going to be limitations to her just being able to wield whatever she needs in that moment, or she would be a little too all powerful there. So I think that, you know, in future books, that would be interesting to see what those limitations are and her kind of pushing the boundaries on that, while on the opposite end with Taryn's power. Hour, she really started small and learning how expansive and capable it is. Another reason why I'm leaning toward this chameleon being her second signet is that Rebecca has stated a lot of readers will figure out what Violet's second signet is. And every reader seems to have their own take on what it is. Most of us are not rallying behind one or two or even three main signet theories. You all, I cannot express how many different signet theories we have gotten in our DMs, in the comments, in our emails, in every which way. Everybody's got a different take on it, which is so exciting. Sure, there are a few more popular ones, distant wielding, amplification, speaking with the dead. But I have to wonder if the answer is technically all of them. All of us are right. Wouldn't that be crazy? Separately, this could also be another supporting point for Violet's amplification second signet. We didn't touch on this too much here because we have talked about that amplification signet so much already where she is amplifying Zayden's intrinsic ability. So it is technically Zayden's intrinsic ability having untapped power, but it is Violet who is causing it. I personally think that's a lot more likely than her being an intrinsic. Nicole, I think you and I are both definitely on the same page here where this is not necessarily her being an intrinsic but her having the intrinsic ability through whatever her signet is that is more on the nose there so basically our conclusion is this is sus <laughs> we don't know <laughs> we do definitely both think that this is a Violet second signet neon sign for sure. And another point too is that what we've already said many times Rebecca has stated that it is right there on the page 
This is a pretty right there on the page. And again, it is so soon after she reaches for Indarna's power. There are no coincidences there. What it means, we don't know, but we are pointing out that it is not a coincidence. Absolutely. I love pointing out every instance of jealous Zayden because it's just amazing. So Violet is giving him a big old slice of this is how I've been feeling with Kat. Pie. Violet gets frustrated when Zayden is saying how Kat didn't make Violet feel anything. And she says, oh, really? Hold my beer. How would it feel for someone who I used to sleep with say that he knew what I tasted like? He knew how I felt on top of him. And she's like, she, it's literally described. She like drips every single word with sex and like lust and all of this kind of stuff. And then Zayden starts avoiding the fucking questions like a little. And Violet brings up a good point. If you want me to ask questions, then stop avoiding them. Hello, foreshadowing for chapter 56 when Zayden definitely avoids the second signet question. But in this moment, Zayden guesses that Violet's exes are from infantry. And she's like, well, fuck, he's right on the money with that. (laughs) So do you think, this brings up the question, do you think that we're going to see any of Violet's infantry exes? I could definitely see it, but I don't see them being a big role at all. Like, for instance, later on when we do get to more battles or they are returning back to Beskayeth, maybe, you know, like they're going to be lieutenants or, you know, they're going to be kind of like rising up in the ranks of the infantry there. There is the popular theory out there that Violet and Halden, who is Arik's oldest brother and the heir to the throne, that they are exes. And while I love that idea, he's at least one year older than Zayden, at the very minimum one year older. I also wonder if because he is the heir that I don't feel like he had to go into the infantry. Like that is something that, yes, you know, if you are a duke or anything besides the king, the heir to the king, then yeah, you you still have to go on to conscription day. But I think that he would have been a little bit too old for a young teenage Violet. So if she did have anything with him, it would be more of like a schoolgirl crush, so to speak. Or Halden crushed on her. And that's going to be kind of like the spiciness that's going to happen between Halden and Violet. And she doesn't have any feelings for him, but he does for her. Now, we've already kind of like been there, done that with Dane. So I don't know. Yeah, I feel like he's just too old. Like, I think that for teenagers, the age gap might be a little bit too much for them to have been in a relationship. I'm in agreement. Now, last little thing I want to point out from this scene is that it's mentioned that Zayden, when he gave Violet her daggers last year, we mentioned this earlier, one of them was to counteract Kat's gifts. And this is one of the 12 daggers that he gave her. But this dagger that counteracts Kat's gift, we learn is the one with the intertwined Vs. Like I mentioned, earlier in this episode something that's been tossed around in the fandom is that Kat is either lesbian or bisexual and that she will end up with one of our female identifying characters by the end of the series a lot of people speculate Rhiannon especially with how much they're thrown together this book but I don't know Rhi has Tara so who knows there but if this is such the case the intertwined V's would be such a fucking cool Easter egg. I would love that. That would be like the ultimate deep Easter egg. That would be such a cool little hint of Kat's sexuality. I would love that. Love that. So let us move into the Eration library. I love hearing Violet make long-term Eration plans. When she and her squad walk into the library, she notes that only the first floor is filled with books because, you know, Arisha burned and books burned too. And she also notes that she's made it her personal mission to see that the second floor is also going to be full of books within the next decade. And I just love she's thinking long-term. She's looking at Arisha and she's making these grand plans. And I just, I love it so much. And her scribe mind too, like again, it's just shining through. And I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. That sounds like some duchess planning right there in my mind. Like, I wonder if it's like hit her that like, oh, if Zayden and I are in game, I will be the duchess of Arisha. I don't think it's hit her yet because we haven't read it on the page. No, I absolutely have not. I, she like just realized that he is technically the heir to Tyrandor. And it's like, yeah, girl, and you're with him. So that also means that you would be up there with him anyway. I also love that she says in the Arisha library, she's finding her center. In the fight scene, right after the throne scene, Zayden says to Violet that she needs needs to be her own center again and he can't do that for her yes I love that that is very healthy relationship how good now she's going back to her books being her center again and I love this she used to recite 
facts to center herself. I mean, remember Parapet when she was crossing it. She starts doing this huge info dump, which, by the way, is delicious to reread now that, especially now that you and I have done so much of this with all the archives knowledge that you've parsed through. Like, it's just, it's really cool to go back because it actually makes sense. And you're like, oh, this is so cool. And yes, she did do this in Corden as well in this book. But I think that's one of the only times she does it, at least up until now. But she's going at it through very different kind of material. Takaris sends books back for Violet that are in Crovelish. He sends them back with Zayden when they're doing a weapons run. And these are for her to read, which like, oh, that's so nice of you. Thank you, Takaris, for actually providing her information, unlike her fucking brother who's hoarding books from her. That's fine. But one of these books is about the emergence of Venon after the Great War war which just some backstory on the great war really fast this is the same war where general daramore the first six's enemy ruined the land of the barons we also know that something a weapon killed off the venom during this great war so somehow they re-emerged after the great war which is what this book is about i also love that she puts these books in like a protective bag like oh she's just such a scribe at heart i love it it's so good and then dane are oh, dane. i feel like because we talk about runes because we talk about the throne scene we forget that like dane's big chunk of his like emotional redemption arc i'll call it at least for me happens in this stretch of chapters and this to me it really is the winning point of the god fucking damn it dane redemption arc is this scene right here violet hesitates as she goes up to meet dane when she calls him to help her out with warwick's journal and then she remembers quote how he stabbed Varish, he called the formation to split the quadrant, and when the truth came to light, he chose exile with a group of people who despise him because it was the right thing to do. I feel like that small little paragraph right there sums up that, yes, he did some bad shit, but here's why we need to start opening up our mind to letting Dane the Hufflepuff, who always does the right thing, back into our heart. This whole half a chapter really, in my opinion, was really beautifully done. We still get Violet grappling with the forgiveness towards Dane, obviously, but we can see that she's at least willing to go into conversations with Dane, sort of, about what happened last year. Even though part of her is still avoiding questions altogether, like I mentioned during Battle Brief, she's like, imbue the stone, please don't ask me questions about Liam and Soleil. Violet's really representing the reader here, or maybe it's just us, the readers, being so in Violet's head. You know, we're all one and the same here. I loved the way that she asks Dane, when did he stop listening to her when she talked because hey that was the whole theme in fourth wing nicole and i talked extensively about how dane never freaking listens to her and she literally point blank asks him right here on the page i love that we get these little descriptions of how dane is nervous to be in this conversation with violet as he should be because he has some explaining to do and i'm not gonna lie i really did love seeing dane's point of view from the last year hearing what happened from his perspective you do sympathize with him and feel his anguish of needing to protect his best friend who he never imagined would be in the writer's quadrant he just survived the grueling first year lost plenty of friends and thought he was through it or at least through the worst of it but then oh shit he had to relive that terror in his his need to protect Violet and that was something that completely threw him off there. Speaking for myself, this is definitely the point of the book where I as a reader started forgiving sort of and opening up to Dane again. Definitely opening up to him and wanting to hear what he had to say, wanting to hear his explanation when Violet didn't want to hear anything from him in all of part one. Yes, I still don't know if I fully trust him yet. Again, Kath has some bad breath. But I do think his redemption arc, it was beautifully done. It is being beautifully done, especially in this chapter. It was a big catalyst for it. Well, and let's not forget that in the torture chamber, especially when we covered that in the episode, Lexi, you and I talked about the speediness of his 180 kickoff of the redemption arc, I'll call it. But it was a speedy moment for our characters. He needed to make speedy decisions. And now that we, and thus Violet, have had some time to sit with it. It's been a few months since that has happened, or at least numerous weeks. And it doesn't feel as fast as, or forced, in my opinion, at all. And it feels like it's the start of the healing chapter for Violet and Dane. Like the catalyst was there. The foundation was there. I, literally, I pulled the paragraph earlier of why the foundation is there. But this feels like it's the start of the healing journey for them. I 100% agree. Yes. Dane does, however, <laughs> taking a hard left. Dane, however, has a big 
non-answer answer moment. Violet asks the questions we've pondered in every god fucking damn it Dane section of Fourth Wing. Quote, did you steal my memories every time you touched my face last year? Literally, when I read that on the page, I was like, oh, has she been listening to God fucking damn it, Dane? <laughs> <laughs> to which Dane answers this question. Did you steal my memories every time you touched my face last year? He says, no. We learn that he did it on accident the first time. More on that in a moment. But we learn that he was just so used to touching her. And she got close to Ryerson. He figured that Zayden was out for revenge. He was worried that, you know, she wasn't listening to him, meaning Dane. And it sounds to me like he was wanting more information it's Dane like he does. So we have to ask the question, when was this accidental first time? His exact wording here is, quote, I did it by accident the first time. I was just so used to touching you and you'd gotten close to Ryerson. So when do you think the first time was, Lex? You know, I mentioned it in a previous episode that I think the first time might have been the day after conscription day. But the way that he says, and you'd gotten close to Ryerson, makes me wonder if it would have actually have to been after threshing, which he had touched her, cupped her face so many times before that. I have a hard time thinking it accidentally happened for the first time after all those cupping of faces, after all those times he'd already touched her in those months leading up to threshing. You'd think it would have happened by accident way earlier than threshing, which is why I feel pulled to say it occurred early in the book, like soon after conscription day when he was set on protecting her and frequently touching her. I also feel like the first accidental time was before he demanded her memory while trying to defend Amber. We all kind of forget that he tried to take her memory without asking. Yeah, I forgot about that too and then I was looking back on all of our fourth wing notes and I was like oh my god how have we not talked about this recently all right <laughs> so, Amber eh, kind of <laughs> <laughs> I have a hard time thinking that the first accidental time would have been after that incident but it was only after that incident that you could consider Violet became close with Zayden so I guess maybe at threshing that could have been the first time but I'm still going to go with soon after conscription day and toss aside the close to Ryerson comment because it just doesn't fit within my God fucking damn it Dane timeline. What do, you, what do you think? Do you think that it was before or after the Amber situation? I think that these are two different instances. Like I think the accidental first time was sometime early in fourth wing and then he did it on purpose after she had gotten close to Ryerson. That's where I'm, there you go. I'm taking these as two separate instances and then however many instances after that with how you know like after she had gotten close to Ryerson. So I think the first accidental time was either after conscription day or I've speculated after when she was under the tree with Satan and all that kind of stuff. Then I think there was a long pause where he would touch her and very actively not read her memories because he didn't want to cross that boundary with her. And then when she'd gotten close to Ryerson, he was starting to get curious. And that's when he started reaching for her more and actually gleaning information. And then obviously at reunification day, he's talking to King Tari. He's talking to General Mel and he's talking to Daddy Atos, he's talking to Lilith, and then he goes over and immediately cups Violet's face. So that's when we know it was an order for him to do that. But I think he was gleaning information before that. Did not think about that, that it would have been two different situations that he was talking about because he makes it seem like it was all in one. That's why so, it's this non-answer answer that drives me crazy. Yeah. Oh, you're so right. I think this is a little bit of Dane with his tail between his legs being like, it wasn't that bad, right? And it's like, no. Dave, it was bad. <laughs> he tried to take her memory when after the whole Amber situation. Like, again, I can't believe we I forgot about that. I forgot about that. That's <laughs> but here's my question, Lex. Do you think we are ever going to get confirmation about this? I think that this was like the wrapping of the bow on the Dane I think touching. So too. Which sucks. <laughs> like, I really wanted to know. Now, unless at some point or another we get a Dane POV, I don't think that's going to happen. Would I like it to happen? I can't believe I'm saying this. Yes, I would. But I don't think we're ever going to get a Dane POV. Or maybe like he does end up being like the big bad and he's like totally double agent all of us. And then he'll do his big villain monologue. And that is when we learn. The Can whole you truth. imagine? Like, <laughs> I know I speculated on it in part one. And I'm still not totally closing the door for that as a possibility, especially with Kath's breath and all the susness around that. I do think that 
Dane is a redemption arc. I do think that this is like he's working his way back into being a confidant of Violet. He's nowhere near, but he will eventually. I think in book three, especially with Zayden being Venon, I think that's going to be a huge wedge in their relationship. And she's going to look to people who she can, you know, lean on. And I do think that Dane is going to be one of those people. Now, I in a platonic way, in a platonic way, in a Thank platonic you. Yes. way, yes, definitely in a platonic way. I do not think there's going to be a love triangle. Full stop. Now, I don't think that Dane is making it out of this series alive. I think that he's going to sacrifice himself for Violet or Zayden or something he's he is dying or Kath is gonna kill him because Kath is Kath's breath smells and that means he's evil <laughs> and I just have to say if we do ever get the chance to interview Rebecca Yaros and have like our own exclusive spoiler heavy interview with her this about when Dane first accidentally takes her memory that's gonna be one of my top questions for her 100% she will probably not answer it but at least we tried <laughs> She'll say, you'll learn about him, book three. And I'll be like, oh, damn it. Why is Dane asking if Violet is in love with Satan? Why is he getting this confirmation? Here's my three possibilities. Number one, because he wants to see if there's a glimmer of a shot for him. Number two, because he wants to know if he needs to start trusting his old best friend's boyfriend, like how invested she is, meaning how invested he needs to be in trusting him. Or C, he's just doing like a Zayden vibe check, I'm leaning away from that because that's kind of anticlimactic. I lean towards... A, because of how his voice breaks, how his jaw flexes, like how he seems kind of sad. He seems like bummed that, oh, darn, she is like fully in love with this guy. And she even says, and that's not going to change, which is like the door closed, locked, barricaded. This is not opening my guy. Which I just got to say one more time with Dane not listening to her. She already told him in the last stretch of chapters that she loved Zayden and explained why in a very short sentence, but she explained why she loved him anyway. He's never listens to her. I think that it is all of the above. Yes, that definitely includes Dane being in love with Violet. Remember that Varish taunted him with how Violet chose Zayden over Dane. It was never outright said, but it was insinuated that Dane loved Violet. And with Varish's signet being able to see weaknesses, I'm sure he knew how Dane felt about Violet and he played him like a fucking fiddle. Until, you know, Dane stabbed him. <laughs> Go, Dane! Because he loved Violet! <laughs> We're going to close the chapter on Dane, at least for right now, and head into another Felix lesson. I want to just start off with how freaking proud I am of our girl. She's learning not only control of her own emotions, but she's learning control over this huge, big signet that she's just starting to learn more and more about. Instead of letting Taryn's power flow with like the double doors of her archives just wide open, she instead cracks just one of those archives door. And as a result, she gets this tiny stream of lightning as with her as the source, which like we cannot stress how cool that is. She is the source now, leading to the conduit. I feel like the scene is often so overlooked by myself included. Like this is not the scene I think about when I'm looking at these stretch of chapters, hello throne scene. But this scene is really exciting seeing how much she is learning over her signet. Yes, she loses it a few moments later when he, you know, pulls it too far and her doors burst open and you know she has to like throw her arms so she doesn't accidentally kill Felix but this is one of those like mastering their power shit that I love in fantasy books like when they're starting to get it but it's not perfected by any means like they're still making mistakes but they're starting to practice we'll say me too I was actually saying this is one of my favorite tropes in fantasy in last week's AMA bonus episode I love the you know honing their power and especially when that power is so great and the person just doesn't even know what to do with it. And then they start controlling it. They start learning exactly what that power is and being curious about it and exploring all of their capabilities. I absolutely love it. It's also so wonderful how Felix encourages her to love her own signet. We talked a lot about this in the episode covering their first training scene, but Violet is really starting to appreciate and explore and marvel at her power instead of fear it. Now, yes, she does still fear herself and how she wields it, but she's not fearful of her power in and of itself and that is step one the excitement doesn't last though because later we learn that the venom are making moves and just took over pavis which is scarily close to drathis aka they're coming for arisha now remember drathis is the last poor million city outside of Arisha slash Tyrandor. So they're on their doorstep, basically, is what they learned because they took Pavis. If they take over Drathis, they're fucked, basically. Well, and speaking of realizing they're fucked, Zayden on a rooftop is brooding. We learn from him in this moment just how outmatched they are in this fight. This is a 
terrifying scene. Yes, we get the ending battle. Yes, they raise the wards and all this stuff, but this is all still prevalent. We still need to fix this going into book three. They're basically a nuance now to the Dark Wielders. Like they are a gnat because the Dark Wielders are so powerful. And Zayden wonders why they don't just take over all of Poramil and Erasia because they have the numbers. They have the power. They are outnumbered, outmanned, outgunned, outplanned, whatever the Hamilton quote is that I mentioned earlier. Will any of this change now that Zayden is a venom? I don't no, I don't know how it would, but I'm not closing the door on that being an option. Also, the Venon want Zayden and Violet. Why? We don't know. We'll get to that chapter when we cover it. But is this why they don't just like barrel straight through the land because they're wanting to absorb them some way? I just, I truly don't know. I'm so confused. I assume that the Venon are preparing for their attack on Navarre and they are trying to be strategic about it. Their ultimate goal, besides Zayden and Violet, is the Veil because it has enough magic to feed them for decades. It would make them unstoppable if they overtook the Veil. Unstoppable against those that can fight against them like say Violet. Now Zayden says, I can't believe this, quote, I have no idea where all these wyvern are hatching from. Does he never listen to Violet? Does no one ever listen to Violet? Even Brennan in chapter, it was like two or three, I can't remember. It was like, yeah, like the wyvern, they're hatching. And then Violet's like making and Brennan's like hatching. And she's like, no, they're making the wyvern. And here, Zayden of all people who knows that they are erecting wyvern, they're not hatching them, they're making. Why does he say hatching here? And then Violet doesn't correct him either. Unforgivable. Like, I get that they're in the moment and all of that. And it's like, might be a bad time for her to be like, um, honey, they actually create wyvern. They don't hatch. That's right. He's having a pretty shit day. It is really gutting to hear Zayden saying that they're 50 years too late. We kind of touched on this a little bit at the top of the episode, but it goes to show how hopeless this cause is. But what other choice do they have except to keep fighting? Like, they don't have another choice. Well, wait, there is another choice because Violet is one determined cookie dead set on raising those wards. Sort of, but we'll get to that hiccup in a second. (laughs) Well, speaking of the reason that she's not able to raise the wards fully. So yes, Warwick sucks because he was not clear in his journal. He does not want anyone besides Navarre to have the information. But Warwick, you got to be a little bit more cryptic, at least in my mind. He says, but the breath of the six and the one combined. And Darna is the dragon den and color that is able to shift and be any other color of dragon, basically, AKA the one combined. So I'm sorry, is this really that awful? <laughs> like, I don't, like, am I missing something? Like this feels pretty non-cryptic to me. Yeah, I can't believe we're <laughs> defending Warwick right now. <laughs> That should be fair. They don't even have it in their mind that there's a seventh dragon den. So I will give them the benefit of the doubt there. But the one combined feels pretty on the nose. Like, I don't feel like that's very cryptic. Like, can you imagine Warwick writing his journal? (laughs) They're never going to get this. And it's like, but dude. (laughs) And at first I was like, is this the stone? Like, is he talking about the stone? But then it says, and set the stone ablaze in an iron flame. So he then goes on to talk about the stone. So to compare, Lyra's journal says the breath of life of the seven combined. So instead of the six and the one combined, it is the seven combined, of course, meaning the seven dragons, which makes it blatantly clear that, oh my God, there are seven dragons. While in his... Well, yes, it is not that off. It is technically correct. It is deliberately confusing to steer the reader in the wrong direction. It's like he knows that that seventh den is not going to be around, which we will absolutely get to all of that speculation later down the line. But he does still include it. Like, why didn't he just say, and the six? Now, he might have done that as a way to make it seem like, you know, like, and the and the seventh rune. You know, like, there are seven positions there. So maybe that's him kind of covering up for there being seven. So is it deliberately confusing? Absolutely. And especially for people hundreds and hundreds of years later, they would not have that additional context to put two and two together. But is it an outright lie? Not really. No. No, it's not. (laughs) I can't believe I'm saying this, but like Warwick, if he did this deliberately, which we know he did, it's not a cool move. But if he, if like there was no context on him having done this deliberately out of malicious integrity, I would have been like, I mean, obviously it's right there. Like I would have been totally team Warwick here. I'm not going to lie. But because we know he did it maliciously, I'm obviously not on his side. Before we finish up the donning our signets section, we need to touch on Violet not wanting to raise the wards because this just 
infuriates me. I'll be straight up honest. She realizes how to raise the ward. She realizes it's dragons needing to breathe fire on the ward stone. Now, to be fair, she realizes it's six. Totally forgetting that and the one combined and whatnot. But I just want to literally face palm here because she's like, I'm not sure if we should raise the wards. Girl, you can save hundreds, if not thousands of lives. The Wyvern and the Venon are on your fucking doorstep. They are in Pavis. They're about to take over Draethus. You know how close they are. You've read a fucking map before. You are on a timeline. Like you have been so stressed out about not being able to raise these wards yet. And now you know that they are literally on your doorstep. So it's more important than ever to raise these wards. And she's like, but the Griffins won't be able to ch- Fuck the Griffins. They <laughs> her for this like I'm I just I don't understand this it's just she is such a logical human and yes she cares about others she wants to make sure they're fine this was definitely a chapter cliffhanger for the sake of being a cliffhanger I remember when I first read this I was like oh shit why shouldn't they raise the wards like thinking that there was some deeper meaning behind this that she found something else in Warwick's journal and then the next chapter very quickly we learn oh it's because then the flyers wouldn't be able to wield. And it's like, yes, like you just said, I get that they're part of your squad now, that you care about others and that you want the flyers to be able to be at their best power. But let's look at the bigger picture here, Violet. Let's look at all of what you've been leading up to for this moment. Like you were risking your life to get this information. And now you're like, yeah, but my new friends might not be able to have as much power. So I don't think we should do it anymore. It was a very anticlimactic reason about why they should not raise the wards. To the point where I'm still wondering if I'm missing something. Same. Correct us if we're wrong. Like, are we mi- like we might be missing something, but I don't feel like we are. I do also see this being the reason of that extra dramatic tension after what's your second signet and him not answering and yada 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 and them needing to go off and raise the wards and da 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 da. So I I also see how this would lead to more dramatic tension with the second signet moment. If that is the case, I'm at peace with that because that moment is so fucking good and beautiful and delicious. So now that we have wrapped up that part of our segment here, let's dive into foreshadowing. Of course, we already talked about quite a bit of foreshadowing, but as always, let's pull out some more nuggets from the stretch of chapters. I will go first. So it's actually more of the opposite of foreshadowing, but a Griffin Flyer Traeger ran his mouth about Ree's border village turning away refugees. This refers back to the propaganda her family sent Ree that Markham confiscated back in Battle Brief and gave a letter about. Ree's particular village was specifically told not to take in refugees because the poor millions couldn't be trusted. And so I found that so interesting, that tie in there from that earlier part of the book. I also love his name is Traeger. Every time I hear that, I just think of the grill. <laughs> like you're the smoker. <laughs> you <a> smoker. <laughs> Violet thinks to herself that she's glad Jack fucking Barlow is one person who stayed behind at Beskayeth because no matter how nice he is to her, she'll never trust that guy. Well, good judgment, Violet. I also believe that in the case chaos following the half of the writer's quadrant leaving, Jack took the opportunity to plant the venom lures. Yes. Oh, that's good thinking. I love that. Sawyer asking for signing lessons. Whatever he learns apparently works because him and Jacinia are definitely an item at the end of this book with how distressed Jacinia is over him losing his leg. Side note though, the awkwardness initially comes off like he's about to ask Violet out and Violet says, Zayden has more than enough confidence to survive me being asked out. I'm sorry, do we not remember the flight jacket? Like, does Zayden really have that much self-confidence? Because clearly not when he thought Bodhi was with Violet. So I'm just going to throw that out there that I don't think he actually has that much confidence. <laughs> Who the fuck's <laughs> flight jacket are you wearing right? <laughs> I will still never forget how the end of that chapter is, I'll get you into one of my flight jackets. Like, they bang, they have sex, and he's still hung up about the fucking flight jacket. I'm telling you, like, I really do think that Sawyer would have been in shreds. Like, he does not, like, he would have have killed him yes. just for asking her out. Yes. Oh, we love her morally gray. Man, there's lots of mentions of how Violet saved Vicia and not Luella, basically choosing the writer over the flyer. Well, next episode, we'll be covering how Vicia literally dies at Solus's hand. And after that, Violet very much chooses the flyer. She puts Cat behind her. Cat is third in line for the Peromish throne. Also, do not forget. So now, while she never really had a chance to save Vicia, Vicia basically gets 
batted out of the picture pretty fucking quickly. She does choose to save the flyer in that moment over her own life. Possible foreshadowing? We've talked about this before, but we have to speak of it right now as well. Kat mentions how she's not going to war with Violet over Zane's affections, but instead over a crown. Many people, including us, think that Kat is going to learn about Arik's standing and switch her sights on a different crown. Unless she's gay or bisexual, and then she's going to go with Rhi, and her intertwining Vs will happen. <laughs> Again, I'm so here for that. Zayden saying, quote, nothing you could ever do would be unforgivable to me. Well, maybe not with Zayden, but I will be very curious how Violet is going to do with forgiving Zayden for turning venom at the end of this book, because... Woof, my guy. I will not. I am so hung up on this still. She is still laying in bed with him after learning that he turned Venon. And in that same Variety article, Rebecca said, you know, like that there's going to be conflict between those two of them. I don't see the conflict yet. Now, to be fair, they did just do a huge battle. They were both super burnt out. I bet they were exhausted. This might be just one of those things of like, honey, we'll fight in the morning about this, but we're so tired right now. Like this might have been a going to bed angry moment. I don't think they fucked that night. I know you said that in the reactions episode, you think they did. I don't think they fucked that night. I think they went straight to bed. But he still says you should be scared of me. And she's like, OK, honey, let's talk about this tomorrow. Let's crawl into bed together and go to sleep. And okay, then, yeah, I can't. And this was also <laughs> after like... <laughs> Now, she does say my love isn't fickle. And he's like, you're going to fall out of love with me. And you learn I'm in a tinsic. Less than a minute. That's how long it took you to fall out of love with me. And she's like, fuck off. My love isn't fickle. Stop telling me what I do with my love. So him saying you should be scared of me is another one of those moments where he's like, you should feel this way. And she's like, fuck you. Let me tell you how I feel. So we don't know what happened between them. But I wonder, I can't believe I'm starting this conversation now. I wonder where book three is going to pick up if it's like, the next morning or whatnot, I have no idea. Anyway, Zayden says, quote, you are the first and only woman I have ever loved. Well, if that ain't foreshadowing between him and his mom's relationship, I don't know what is. Zayden says that Violet and him are endgame. First and foremost, I love this contemporary writing, very meta here, how everyone's like, are Zayden and Violet going to be endgame? Literally, Rebecca's telling us right here, Zayden and Violet are going to be endgame. Also, nice little Taylor Swift call out there as well, I'm assuming it is. But I also do want to know who's endgame, the story's endgame or one of their lives the Zen game because I don't know if they're making it out of the story alive. I have to open that up because I don't know if I will emotionally be able to deal with it if I don't. All of the foreshadowing around the Venon taking Pavis and heading toward Orisha. Yes, they do indeed make it to the Tyrandor border, but thanks to Violet's half words, the Wyvern fall and the Venon retreat. Bye bye. Zayden said he wishes she'd stop being considerate and just ask him the damn questions. They're talking about the Pavis battle, but Violet thinks, quote, I swallow, getting the feeling he's not talking about today's loss. Correct. He's wanting her to ask about the deal he made with her mother. I mean, he could also just tell her, but nope, he wants her to ask the questions. Zayden saying he knows why Mira ordered him off the field in Pavis because she didn't want to risk Violet. Violet challenges Zayden saying there's no way he could know that since Mira didn't tell him, to which Zayden says, I do. Yes, indeed. You are an intrinsic. You were able to read her intention. You absolutely did know that that is what she meant. And last but not least, to wrap up our foreshadowing section here, Dane says about Warwick that it's likely he's deliberately fucking with them from the grave. Yep, he definitely is. He purposefully made the raise the ward phrasing confusing so it couldn't be replicated confusing air quotes. <laughs> now let us step into the archives where each episode Lexi educates us all on a prominent world building topic and boy oh boy do we need the education on today's topic runes. Quick shout out to our Patreon members Seely Queen and Brooke for contributing to today's archives. I really needed the extra help this week. So let's kick it off with what are runes? They're strands of magic pulled from a bonded person's power, which means that both dragon riders and griffin flyers can create runes. Actually, Venon can as well because they place runes inside of Wyvern, but we don't know much else about how they create or use runes, just that they do use runes to essentially activate Wyvern. Runes are woven into geometric patterns for specific uses, then placed into an object for immediate work or usage at a later date. This process of placing 
placing the woven magic into objects is called tempering. The rune will activate when triggered and perform whatever action it is tempered for. Unlike alloy, which stores power, runes are tempered with power for a specific action. If you can get good enough at runes, you can compete with a fair amount of signets. These geometric patterns are a logosyllabic language similar to Old Lucerish or Moranian. Because this is embedded in Tyrish culture, I have to wonder if it's an old Tyrish language. I don't know that, but that's just some speculation. Now let's move on to how to create runes. Like I said, they are geometric patterns woven with an individual's power strands. Let's talk about these power strands. They are invisible to anyone but the wielder, and identifying or working with these strands of power is the biggest learning curve when it comes to learning how to do runes. The first thing you need to learn before creating a rune is to know how to separate a piece of your own power. As you initially learn, it's best that your bonded dragon or griffin are present. The closer the source, the easier it is for the first time. Quick side note, I wonder how that works with Venon. I wonder if they had to draw from the source in order to get that rune going. I have a quick speculation on that real quick for the wyvern rune. Because it's now showing like we're getting more and more wyvern entering our story because nature likes all things in balance, I wonder if Venon have to kill someone, draw like almost draw from their energy source and pour it into this rune and that creates a wyvern. I think that is definitely why they're so strategic about where they are targeting because they are drawing magic because they have to draw that magic whether it's from people or just the magic from that source there and that is why there are more wyvern because more magic that they're sourcing means more wyvern that they're able to create. Violet describes this as the delicate strand of pearlescent power meaning Andarnas which her new mental color is pearlescent that she bends into shapes that creates a pattern. I just love this visual so much. It then burns brightly in front of Violet while she gently reaches for another. This strand of power power is described as both solid and insubstantial. They're glowing strands that flex under her touch. Now each shape of these geometric patterns has meanings and the points where the person ties the power changes the meaning. I love that so much. The shape contributes to the rune's purpose, influencing what it does, when it activates, how many times it can activate, and much more. Once you understand which shapes combine to make what symbols, the combinations are nearly limitless. Now until these woven patterns are tempered into an object, aka the power is placed into an object, this magic has no meaning or purpose and it will fade quickly. Tempering the rune is key and it makes it an active magic. Once the rune is placed, you can see the geometric patterns etched into the object, whether it's on daggers or stone or wood like in Professor Triss's class. Last thing on this part here, a rune is only limited to how much power you choose to temper, how long you want it to last, and how many uses it has before it depletes. It's so cool like how you just have so much power in creating these runes and how the options are absolutely limitless. Let's take a step back and talk about the history of runes. They were a signature skill that the Tyrish ones controlled and perfected, but making runes was banned a couple hundred years after the reunification of Navarre, so approximately 400 years before our story begins. However, many of Navarre's outposts and even Beskaith itself was built upon them. I have a feeling we'll learn more about all of those in later books of our series. Now, why were runes banned, you asked? Writers are naturally more powerful, given the amount of magic they channel and the signets they wield. But runes are the great equalizer. So in an effort to eliminate this equalizer, Navarre banned runes so they wouldn't fall in the wrong hands. The wrong hands being Griffinflyer's hands. Although I personally believe this was also to keep power among the writers within Navarre. They lose a shred of their eliteness if anyone else, even other Navarians, can leverage any kind of magic. I'm willing to bet that it was the writers who made this rule. All bonded marked ones learn how to create runes, but no one outside of Tyrandor even know what runes are. And that surprisingly, at least to me, includes poor meal. All right, so now that we know what runes are, how to make them, and the history, let's identify some of the runes that have been introduced in our story so far. We know of several variations of protective runes, including protection against mind work like cats. Zayden places rune in one of Violet's daggers, and it shields cat from being able to use her mind work on Violet. Then the big kahuna, the protection runes that the rebel officers gave their children before they left for the Battle of Arisha, created by Colonel 
Calamari, who is the last person in the world who knew how to temper this kind of protective rune. It was designed to counter the signet of the rider whose dragon would kill them, but it could only be activated when killed by Dragonfire, aka the rebel officers knew that they would be executed by Dragonfire, and the dragon that executed them was Coda, and his rider is General Melgren, so the protective rune was specifically designed to counter against his signet, which is seeing the outcome of battles. This is why his signet is useless if more than three marked ones are together. This protective rune also left a relic on the children of the rebel officers, as we discussed earlier. Other types of runes are simple ones that our second years learn, such as a heeding rune and a hearing rune. Another one that Zayn placed on one of Violet's daggers unlocks doors when she has great need. Violet unknowingly used this to escape the interrogation assessment, and she could have accessed Bisgaia's forge had she needed to. Further down the list, we have tracking runes, which can track someone else's runes. Shouts for Cat for being the only one in second year to achieve this. There are, of course, the runes that power the ward stones. We don't know very much about those, except that they are there. There are also very old, very complicated masking runes that are placed in the canyon to hide that ward stone, so people, when they're flying over, can't see it. There are runes etched into Violet's conduit that Felix wove to draw specific power. There are runes on the chest that hold items, or <clears throat> venom, suspended in midair. And last but not least, there are runes to explode on impact, which are tempered into mayor sight arrowheads. So there you have it. I hope that helps you understand a little bit more about runes and everything else about them. I cannot wait to see where runes go in the story. I love this shit. <laughs> Let us take flight with our favorite moments to close out this episode. Number one, recalling Cat a quote, walking piece of terror. I might start using this phrase in like everyday life. Watch out people. Everything around Sawyer asking for sign lessons. We talked a few moments ago about Zayden's confidence with Violet being asked out and how we're not so sure about that. But I also love that Riddick says that he'd teach Sawyer the sign for sex to Telling him it's dinner. Lexi, this is 100% something your husband would do. <laughs> I know, it's totally something he would do. Oh my gosh. <laughs> now, I don't know why I love this line so much, but God damn it, I do. It's, quote, I kiss him quickly just because I can. Like, oh, squee. I love that. I love that line so much. Also, big shout out to our second squad. They are so united. Re mentions how no matter what, all 11 of them will travel mat to mat to support whoever is called. They are just such a unit. They are just one, they are a family, and I absolutely love them. Until Cat's Drift gets added to them. Womp. Yeah, until Cat's Drift gets added to them. Everything about Taryn and Andarna's fighting advice to Violet. Andarna says, scratch her eyes out. Really, the eyes are the softest tissue. Just jab your thumb right in there. And Darna, use some common sense. The kneecaps are a much easier target. It's like, can you imagine just having these two like in your head? I just love it so much. I love how Violet goes, <laughs> quiet time now. <laughs> like, please leave. Yeah. <laughs> I love that Violet switches her fighting style to Rees instead of Zayden's thus totally throwing Kat off guard. Now, to be fair, Kat's also been taught how to fight Venon. I think she was a little bit distracted, though, so I'm going to give her yes. the benefit of the doubt, I guess. Ugh, gross. From the throne scene. I mean, everything from the throne scene is a favorite moment <laughs> of mine, but this one specifically, quote, and before you start another argument, I'll fuck you later tonight. Trust me, I'm making a momentary point, not a lasting vow of masochism. <laughs> oh, Zayden. This is probably my favorite moment, full stop, from this stretch of chapters, and yes, that includes the throne scene. Violet, thanking Kat for the trick with the fingers and then everyone just basically being like oh shit <laughs> like, yeah I love that it's so good I mean as a fandom too we're like oh <laughs> I love sassy Violet life coach Taryn is coming back with vengeance Violet asks him quote what is it like to go through life so self-assured and he answers it's life <laughs> Good answer there, buddy. Violet says about the incoming snowstorm that she thinks they'll get seven inches tonight. And Zayden says, maybe more if you're good. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Zayden, make more dick jokes, please. Oh, man. Well, friends, that is it for today's episode. Thank you so much for joining us. Next episode, we are hitting the double digits, episode 10. We are going to be covering chapters 52 through 56. Ooh, it's going to be a doozy. That is the intrinsic chapter, and I'm so excited. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, as always, to our executive producer, Hayden, a.k.a. our sanity manager. We truly don't know what we would do without you, especially this week. Yes. And please be sure to join the Patreon party if you feel so inclined and give us a follow on Instagram and TikTok at Fantasy Fangirls Pod. 
do not forget to also rate and review the show. It takes two seconds to click that five star button to hit that subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube and it really helps us get up the charts, which helps more people find the show. Speaking of helping more people find the show, share this episode with your fellow Iron Flame friends. You know who those friends who you've been squeeing together over the throne scene. This is your opportunity. This is your moment to share with them an extra bonus moment on the throne scene where you can deep dive it with us together and you can make them fall in love with the fantasy fangirls just like you do. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate you all bearing with me through my cold. It has been quite the week. So thank you so much. And we will talk to you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye. Dive deep into beloved fantasy lore character themes. I want to do that one more time. I'm spitting now. Hold on one second. Robe earlier that Oh my god. I'm terrified to edit this episode. <laughs> so Hold on, let me go get my map. Okay, so see, so this is. You realize this is an audio medium, right? There are 47 episodes. I'm so sorry. I just spilled water all over myself. Oh, we're doing great. Oh. We're doing great. <laughs> Thanks, we do for content. Lord, there's a plane outside that sounds like it's landing on my roof. 